Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining in for this third and last day of Machines Can See. I'm Ivan Laptev, and I will guide you through the talks of today. Before we start with our technical problem, I am pleased to open this day with welcome words from a very distinguished person, an AI visionary, a top 100 global CEO and businessman, someone who has been a true driving force for innovation for artificial intelligence in Russia, the president and the chairman of Sberbank, Herman Greff. Dear friends, I'm happy to welcome you to the fourth international summit Machines Can See 2020, which was organized by Vision Labs. Vision Labs is more than just the organizer of the summit. It is also one of the leading developers of computer vision and machine learning products. Sberbank pays close attention to AI innovations, including computer vision. Despite the challenging times, we keep developing the international tech community each year. The Machines Can See Summit brings together more and more participants and partners, uh, becoming a prom prominent venue gathering the best computer vision researchers across the globe. I wish you all participants fruitful and interesting discussions. Thanks to Herman Graf for those welcome words and support. We now switch to our main program. Our first two presentations of today will touch upon the subject of computer vision, machine learning, and computer graphics. Automatic generation of images by neural networks has been a very popular topic showing amazing results in the last few years. In particular, automatic generation of human avatars is motivated by telepresence and other applications which are becoming very relevant in our current online situation. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Yasser Sheikh. Yasser directs the Facebook Reality Lab in Pittsburgh, and he's also an assistant professor, associate professor in Carnegie Mellon University. His work has been influential both in computer vision and computer graphics. Just an example, his work on convolutional pose machines a few years ago has set a new standard for a classical computer vision problem of human post estimation. We are very happy to have Yasser today with us, who will be talking about photorealistic telepresence. And we remind you that uh, our talks are actually recorded and Yasser is with us here today and he is available for uh, answering questions in the chat in the comment section, which is just below the uh, video player which you are watching. So please welcome to watch the talk and ask questions if you wish. All right, thank you. So today I'll be talking about photorealistic telepresence. When uh, people look at this image, uh, they can see an image that's flooded with social signal, right? Uh, there's a lot of information over here that people can see and interpret and understand from um, James's gaze at uh, Daniel over here. Um, they're obviously sharing a joke uh, to Hernan in the foreground over here, gesturing to Hirsch, um, to Vicky at the back, Victoria at the background, uh, making an expression of, uh, of amusement, right? These are, these are highly informative um, uh, in pieces of information for us that we can perceive visually. Um, and then if we ask, when a machine looks at this single static image, what can a machine see? And in, in today's state of the art, it's an extremely impoverished uh, representation of what humans can extract out of this uh, system, right? And the reason for this is that humans are social animals. We are, we all are. Um, it's, it's been shown through research that our health, our happiness, and even our productivity depends in large part on how adept we are at socialization. Uh, and so one of the uh, core challenges that we have uh, with engaging with other people is and always has been distance. 
So most of you will have either um, uh, moved from the place where you grew up or were born, or you know people, your friends, your family members who have done so as well. And it's a kind of fact that we are all aware of that proximity determines social relationships, right? Where you live determines who you have relationships with, who you meet every day. And when you move away, then those relationships that you had with people, no matter how strong, start to degrade over time. And to overcome this over history, uh, people have used many sort of um, techniques or mechanisms. We've developed them just to overcome that distance and just to be able to connect with other people. The Postal Service, you know, centuries ago, was started with the, with the goal of transmitting information across distance, but it was fundamentally limited because it didn't have that sort of um, uh, bandwidth of communication that we, we, our perceptual systems have evolved to extract. The telegraph was the first innovation in the, uh, in the 1800s, which let information travel more or less instantaneously. But it kept the core content of the message, but removed all of the contextual information that uh, carries a lot of the meaning that's important when you engage with somebody else. And that's one of the reasons why when the telephone was invented, it spread with, uh, in such wildfire, like such wildfire. And the reason was because now for the first time, some of that social signal that we, that our perceptual systems are very adept at picking up, the, the tone of voice, prosody, for the very first time, you could communicate that to another person over distance. And of course, in the 1950s, uh, video conferencing came along, of course, not the iPhone, um, but the technology to look and see the other person's face as well and um, uh, interpret those expressions, facial expressions, sometimes even body gestures that, uh, that you really uh, uh, observe when you're in the presence of the other person, right? And this has been something today. Uh, of course, all of us uh, with, the, with the COVID pandemic uh, see the value of, and uh, it's giving us the ability to at least maintain some of those relationships that would otherwise have been very difficult or impossible to maintain. But what's next, right? Is there some limitation? What is the reason why we are all frustrated, uh, quite frustrated and uh, feel limited by, by these instructions to stay at home and distance from one another? It's because video conferencing fundamentally lacks how it feels to be in another room with another person, right? When you're in, in that environment, the picture I showed at the start of this talk, where people were really engaging, they were sharing that space. Compare that sort of an experience of sitting in that room with those people to uh, what we all experience and what we're experiencing right now with these talks uh, in terms of an interaction, right? Over here, no matter how engaged uh, these people are, you can see none of them seem to be, they cannot make eye contact. Like the very basic essence of a social interaction is missing. You cannot look at another person in the eye and interact with them. Uh, and even if they are engaged in paying attention, it's not clear that they're, they're actually um, who is, it's not, there's no signal going to Mary as she's speaking if anyone's actually listening to her or not. And this makes these interactions unengaging and very difficult to um, uh, sustain or build relationships with. Even in the stock right now, I struggle a little bit to give this talk because I don't see an audience. I cannot look at someone in the audience, make eye contact, and see if you're actually getting what I'm saying or if I'm just going on some random tangent. And one of the um, uh, like key observations over here, besides the fact that you know these basic elements of interaction that we can't make eye contact, I can't point to something in my environment with you understanding what I'm pointing to, is this notion of shared space. Like perhaps the reason present day two-way communication falls so short of face-to-face -face communication is simply that it fails to provide facilities for externalizing models. I have a model of the world, a message in my head that I want to share with you. You have one. If we're in the same room together, we pull out a whiteboard, we draw flow diagrams, we take pieces of stationery and move them around. We point to, point to things, point to each other. Though that sharing of space and, external, and using that shared space to externalize models, this is the key thing that's missing from video conferencing. And it's why we spend you know, billions of dollars traveling, flying to see friends and family, pulling people in to do interviews in person. The reason why we travel is because of the inadequacy of the video conferencing systems today, this particular one. And now there's a new opportunity that presents itself with um, artificial reality. In other words, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. So these are headsets that have uh, emerged over the last couple of years. The Oculus Rift, for instance, uh, the Sony PSVR, uh, Google had one, HTC had one, and of course, Oculus released the Quest, which is a standalone headset last year. And in addition to this, uh, the Microsoft HoloLens and Magic Leap 
have, have um, uh, released these augmented reality headsets as well. And these are in essence, 3D displays, right? So they give the opportunity at least for you to immerse yourself in a 3D environment. And this presents the opportunity to see if we can, using uh, machine learning, computer vision, computer graphics, put another person in that space with you and make it as compelling as meeting them in, in the real world, right? So the core sort of challenge over here is how can we enable authentic communication in these sorts of artificial realities, in virtual reality, augmented reality? And the challenge in this problem is in the statement itself. The two operative words, authentic and artificial, are opposites of each other, right? It is, we are trying to gain a sense of authenticity in what is essentially an artificial environment. And what we have to overcome is the most sophisticated perceptual system in the world, which is the human perceptual system looking at human behavior. So it's a very high bar, and there are lots of challenges in overcoming this. So what we see today, if you look uh, online to see what sort of apps are available for, say, VR, you still have, see a lot of social VR apps, and these are quite effective when the objective of the interaction is not talking to another person, but something else like playing a game or, or something of that sort, right? And one of the things to observe is that despite the extremely high uh, demand right now for uh, communicating over distance, these apps still have not in any significant way displaced video conferencing as a means of communication. And one of the core theses of um, the work that we were pursuing is that uh, the reason is because there has to be authenticity. What you look like, how you sound like, these are things which are very important in communicating information and connecting with another person. And unless we aim to replicate photorealistically, or as we say over here, metrically, what the person is doing, it's very difficult to uh, really feel like you're communicating with them. And therefore people will, will, will default to things like video conferencing or telephone calls where that sort of authenticity is, is preserved, even though it's a more limiting um, application from the shared space perspective. So um, it's worth perhaps asking at the start of this, what is the state of the art in telepresence? Likely the earliest work in this uh, space was by uh, Takeo Kanadia and his colleagues at CMU in the, in the, in the late 90s, uh, when they talked about virtualizing reality, which means they wanted to they build these capture systems where you could go, um, multiple people could interact, and that sort of performance would get virtualized in three dimensions, right? And you could experience it afterwards as well. Um, this work continued in the 2000s. One sort of like high point was the tele-immersion work by Professor Rosina Bashi at, at Berkeley, uh, where they actually started the first real-time experiences. But, no, but uh, nonetheless, even over here, there was a lot of infrastructure involved, lots of cameras in the scene and there was a lack of a, of a real 3D display. In the modern sort of like uh, time in our, our current decade probably, uh, the, the prominent work over here that really sort of reignited interest in this and popularized it was the holoportation work uh, by, the, by Sharam Azadi's group in Microsoft and then in Google. And here they showed pairing this up with the HoloLens that you could actually experience this in real time in 3D. Um, now, one of the common themes in all of these three, three works, like this, this uh, series of work, is that it's very infrastructure heavy, right? So um, the virtualized reality work had 51 cameras in the scene uh, that were required to do the reconstruction. And then in the, in the most latest uh, holoportation work, it was um, 12 stereo pairs, right? So these had to be placed all around the scene. In contrast to this, uh, there's another approach which is more uh, model-based as opposed to measurement-based. And this is the work, for instance, uh, prominently showed in the graphics community, uh, the WikiHuman project by, um, by a number of teams around the world, uh, the Siren project by Epic Games, and then most recently, Digital Doug um, by uh, Digital Domain. Right? Uh, in comparison, this is a, a result also model-based, which we've been pursuing, uh, which I'll show right now. So this is where we are. There's this big, ugly sucker out the door, and he said, Who do you think you are, Lena Horn? And I said, No, but that I knew Miss Horn like a sister. And she told me next time I was in town to come and look her up. Well, next thing you know, it was Lena this and Arnold that, and oh, have you met the Duke? He's right over there. 
And that club was jumping and jiving. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. So while this is obviously not perfect, right? There's, there are several artifacts in there. It looks uh, pretty good in terms of its realism. And it is, in fact, this was a rendering in 3D. So you can actually see it in 3D at 90 frames per second. It's rendered uh, and it's also parameterized. That's a key kind of like aspect of it, which means that there are, there's a, uh, there's a small set of numbers which you can manipulate that actually drive this, this rig. Um, and the, the purpose of it is that we want to be able to drive these, uh, these avatars in real time. If, for instance, I am here in Pittsburgh and Danny is in some other place in, in the world, we could still have a conversation as if we were in each other's presence, as I'll show here. Well, um, what can your face do? Can you show us? Well, I've always hoped you would ask me that question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I have some pretty good, I think, mouth movement. How about your eyes? Can you can you look left, right, up, down? Um, good, good, good. Yeah, I can do surprise. Ah, ooh, I like my. I think one of my favorites is puffing my cheeks. Mm, the mouthwash, mouthwash commercial. Mm -hmm. And rolling my tongue. Mm. Mm, that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, not a lot and of people think, can do that. Yeah, one sort of good test is: uh, can we get through like the first few letters of the alphabet? A, B, C, D. That. And so what you see over here is it's uh, an interpretation of um, uh, human communication as uh, a network of signals, right? Where uh, with our face, with our uh, bodies, with our, with our speech, we're trying to communicate information to somebody else. They're receiving it, responding to it. And it's, it's kind of, a, it is in fact a, a, a communication network. And so this is the view we take of it. There are two, two sort of like sites or, or nodes uh, where uh, a paired receiver transmitter exists, which is of course, the person on both sides, they are separated by some distance. And then uh, the task is to build some system with sensors on it that can actually sense what the face and the body uh, and the and the and speech is being produced, uh, encode it in some way, right? So like compress it, encode it, transmit it over the network remotely, and then have a decoder on the other side that can decode this message and then render it on a display uh, like an HMD or an AR display or even a screen, right? And one of the kind of curious things about this decoder, which I will talk about um, subsequently, is that uh, it's the decoder is actually conditioned or dependent on the encoder itself. So how you decode how the other person looks to, to me depends on how I'm looking at them. And this is, uh, this is due to illumination, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And then further, you know, we of course want to be in a particular location of anyone's choice. We could choose to meet in my area, my sort of like surroundings. We could choose to meet in the other person's surroundings, or we could choose to meet somewhere else, like the 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 peak of Mount Everest, or in the Taj Mahal, or or um, any other place like that. So I'm going to talk about each of these pieces and what our ideas are on on addressing some of the issues involved in figuring these out. So the core kind of like uh, innovation is something which we call codec avatars, and uh, we've been sort of developing these since about 2017. Uh, you know, the early ones were the ones that you saw over there. In 2008, we improved uh, the, the resolution and detail in the teeth. Uh, we added hair in 2018. Uh, eyes were upgraded in 2019. Uh, and, and more recently, we've been looking at hands and bodies as well and seeing where we can go from there. So let's look at this, uh, this, this thing which we call a codec avatar. What is it, right? So a codec is, uh, in essence, an encoder and decoder. And you'll see why this now starts to apply to what machines can see and why the computer vision community, the machine learning community, and the graphics community should consider this kind of a core problem uh, in that domain. So a codec avatar in essence is two functions, FC and FD, where FC is the encoder. So it takes uh, data from sensors like cameras and microphones, encodes them into a vector, which, can, which uh, represents the instantaneous behavior of, uh, of the individual. And then there is a second function, FD, which is a decoder. It takes that code and produces what the viewer would want to see inside uh, VR or AR or on other displays, right? And so we'll start with this decoder and what that is. So the decoder, in essence, produces, the, at a simple version, an image for the left and right eye, so that stereoscopically you can get a feeling of something in 3D. Uh, and it takes as input into this function the code. So this code you can think of as some sort of representation, which encodes what the person is actually, what the state of that person is instantaneously. 
And it also depends, as I talked about earlier, on the receiver's code. So now that you're seeing me, what your state is influences how we decode and produce these two images. And of course, you know, we use compositional net, um, uh, functions, deep, deep learning methods to uh, define this and the weights or whatever the parameterization of this function is uh, are, in, are included here as well, where these are the decoder parameters. And, uh, you know, we have uh, the, um, the identity index i. Oops, sorry. Okay. The true form of this, of course, is it's not enough to just think visually. In this particular case, it's important to also think about the full sensory experience. We would like to have smell and uh, touch and all of that. But at the very least, the two primary modalities of, of social communication, we should have are, of course, vision and audio. And then the input, uh, this input of the, um, of the environment it will also color where, how you look and how you sound. So for instance, in this particular environment, since I'm outdoor, you can see there's a, there's a lot of light coming in. Um, it's an overcast day, so there are no shadows. Um, and because I'm outdoors, there's a certain reverberance that uh, is produced by the wall behind me and the open area in front of me, right? So all of these influence what, what gets produced. And this function D recall is this decoder in this network, right? Now, so what is this function FD? It is a, a neural network. That's how we model it right now, because those are our most powerful function approximators right now. And so it's the, it's the tool of the day. Uh, and so we, we go from this like 128 floats right now to a mesh, uh, which is a 3D representation, a collection of 3D points. Here it's like 23, uh, 112 divided by three number of vertices that represent the geometry of this ship. And then you can see this is actually fairly low resolution geometry, but it's registered meaning every vertex actually has a, has a particular kind of like meaning or, or a, a anatomical uh, landmark. And so that this, uh, the, now one of the observations we make is that in fact, the texture of the person changes based on the expression that you make. So for instance, if you look at uh, Shuri over here, when he scrunches his face up to make this expression, blood rushes to the temples and, and you see an increased redness in this area and around his eyes. And so the same code which encodes the geometry or the mesh also encodes the texture, right? And this is kind of like um, uh, critical. It encodes the, the texture as well. And uh, so you can see this over here with this texture sort of unwrapped. Uh, you can think of this like a, like a globe, like a map of the world. It gets unwrapped, so you see it in two dimensions. Similarly, we've unwrapped the texture in two dimensions as well. And as you change these parameters of the, of the code, you can see the geometry and the, and the texture change uh, in a correlated way, which is what it should do. And then finally, what we can do is we can take this mesh and texture and render it through a differentiable renderer to the image, right, to the actual pixels. And this is where this concept of metric telepresence, not something that just looks photorealistic, but something which is actually what the person did. We try to recover exactly what the person did as far as we can. And so what you see over here is this white line is sweeping back and forth between the rendered image and the real image. And if you can't, can't clearly see the line, that means we're doing a good job of replicating uh, what, the, what um, uh, Nadia here actually was doing. And so this is kind of the concept of metric telepresence, directly minimize the difference from real image pixels as much as we can. What does this code actually look like? So if you take this code and sort of like fix all the values, which folks who've used things like other, other um, uh, dimensionality reduction techniques like PCA, for instance, oftentimes you can vary one of the values and see what the influence is on, on, the, on the production on the other side, right? So over here we do exactly that. Each of these faces is holding all of the other values that mean and just varying the, 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 an individual value of this code uh, plus minus sigma. And there's a very interesting behavior for, especially for those of you who've seen these sorts of visualizations for uh, PCA. Uh, it's a similar sort, right? You see this kind of like repetitive back and forth movement. But one interesting thing to note is the movement, for instance, over here, if you look at the first one, it's non it's nonlinear. It doesn't have that linear aspect that these that usual linear subspaces produce, right? And the second is that's asymmetric. Like as you move backwards and forwards, there isn't an asymm there isn't a symmetry between those those movements. And that's of course uh, um, uh, an artifact of the fact that this is a, a nonlinear reduction. But it's interesting to see what, what sorts of things in a somewhat, in actually in an unsupervised way, uh, the system produces. So one of these elements, as you change them, produces one of these movements. Now, why is it that we made this condition on, in fact, the receiver's 
um, uh, code, right? Why, why does it matter how I look at you? Why does it matter how you should appear to me based on where I look at you? And the reason is reflectance or illumination, right? If you look at the, the lobes of illumination on uh, the face here, where you're looking at the person from changes where those lobes are. So if you're familiar with, uh, with um, reflectance, uh, it's because, of course, faces and other objects are not Lambertian, right? Where you look at them, specularities, things of this sort, depend on where the viewer looks at the object from. And so that's something which changes over here too. And that's why the receiver's code is conditioning the input in this case. And so what we do is we have this network that I just described and just the texture, not the geometry, but just the texture is conditioned by the view, the, the, where the person is viewing uh, the, the face from, right? And if you notice, it's only the texture and not the geometry, because obviously where I look at you from doesn't change your, your geometry. And so here is the, here's an example of uh, what that looks like. So this is the same geometry rendered from four different perspectives. And what you're seeing over here is the unwrapped texture. So you can see what a difference conditioning makes. Each of these has been conditioned differently according to where the person's viewing it from. And you can see like there are lots of dark areas uh, in this or, or noisy areas. And the reason is because neural networks are famously lazy and they don't expand uh, their capacity to render those areas at all. So we'll, let's look at this. The geometry is the same, but the texture is different for each one of these to produce the images that you see here. All right, so this is the full pipeline. You can see over here what we're doing is we have the code. It decodes into the geometry and texture. The texture also takes the view code. These get combined and rendered as this expression. And what you're seeing over here is we're going to sort of change the viewing direction. So we're going to sort of like uh, uh, orbit around the, around the person and you can see how the texture changes while the expression changes as well. So you can see we're moving it from left and right and the, the, the decoder changes the, um, the, um, the decoded texture. And that produces this image that you see over here. And it, 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 as you move to the sides, it illuminates the face for, properly just like uh, you would have expected to had you been viewing it from there. So how did we actually produce this? So to produce this, we had this uh, system which we call Mugsy. Uh, it is uh, um, a massively multi-view uh, capture system. It contains, you know, 100 microphones, 160 high-resolution, high-frame rate cameras, and about 450 lights. And it captures this data at about 90 hertz, the, the visual part at least. And so it's likely that the center of this dome is uh, among the most, if not the most, densely imaged space in the world right now. And what does it produce? It produces data like this. And you can see like uh, lots of facial expressions um, from a lot of views you can see from the top, from the back. Uh, and there is enough detail over here that you can see what uh, Israel had for lunch um, as well. Right? So lots of detail in there too. And using this, using purely like um, uh, multi-view reconstruction techniques, no, no photometry, no, no tracking. This is a frame by frame 3D reconstruction of, um, of what's happening inside that space. Right? You can also produce this mesh. Um, we run uh, detectors of, of high quality, you know, looking at the teeth, uh, the lips, the eyes, the iris, uh, you know, the, the eyelids, uh, the nose and nostrils, and these really sort of like stick on it as you would want to. And these key point methods have really um, matured over the last couple of years, and they form a, a, an important backbone of our method. And that lets us do these sorts of tracks which are highly accurate. You can see this mesh superimposed. This is zoomed into the, the, the cheek area of the person. And if you, if you track any point over here, you'll see it's really precisely tracked as well. And that captures all of that subtle signal that we're so um, sensitive to and, and allows us to, to you know, properly model it. And so this is the entire pipeline. It goes through reconstruction, key point detection, model-free mesh tracking. We build some personalized key point detectors. We uh, run a model-based tracker. And then finally, we, we learn uh, this, the, the weights of that network based on the tracked pipeline. Right. So it's a, whole, uh, it's a whole sort of cascade, uh, which is highly computationally expensive right now, but it is a one-time offline process. And then the output is something like this. Hi, my name is Steve Lombardi. For those that don't know me, I'm a researcher at the Pittsburgh lab working on codec avatars. The goal of our work in Pittsburgh is to create a system that enables social experiences in VR and AR, just as you would have them in real life. So you see, this is a, a, a rendering actually of the, of the system. Great. I'll let my avatar speak while I just sit on the couch. But I was told that I should probably show up. So please welcome real Steve. 
And here what you're seeing is uh, eight different avatars. On, on one side is the rendering, on the right side, and on the left side is the, uh, is the real image, actually it's the other way around. And the white line sort of separates the rendering from the real one, and it's going to sweep again. After a while, the line will disappear, but it'll still be sweeping. So if you can see the line, or the more you can see the line, the worse job we've done. The less you can see it, the better it is. So now you'll see the line disappears, but it's still actually uh, sweeping. And you can see because we're minimizing pixel differences, it really produces uh, uh, you know, results which are faithful to what the person was actually doing. Not whether it was plausible or just looked good, it actually is what the person was doing. Which is, which is key when we're talking about communication, right? Like, because we want to be uh, honest with what you're sending and we want users to trust this as a medium. And so that was one half of this discussion, right? That was the decoder part. Can you get a code and then produce images that look realistic to the person who's seeing them? And then the second part of this is the encoder. Can we actually drive these things uh, in real time by sensing what the person's actually doing, right? And so the encoder is the other half of this question where sensor data comes in, it gets encoded in some way to produce that code. And so what is uh, the encoder? The encoder produces as output this code, this representation of what me, the user, is currently doing, uh, or the transmitter is currently doing uh, at that state. And how does it figure that out? How does it infer that? It uses as input, let's say cameras, right? Like cameras looking at the person. And now you will see like there's a real challenge in trying to figure this out because this data will always be incomplete. You're never going to get you know, pure measurements the way you can with video conferencing, say, or with, um, with microphones. It'll always be some sort of piecemeal view of the, of the body or the face. And then we can also use inside out cameras. We can use microphones as input as well. And there are a host of other sort of modalities that are coming out uh, these days, such as EEG, um, uh, DOT, IMUs, and those sorts of things as well. For the sake of this discussion, we're going to stick with, with cameras though, since this is the machine skin C conference. Um, and once again, for this encoder, similarly, there are encoder parameters. Uh, there's the identity index I for this for these encoder parameters. And the, just as a recall, just to recall, this is the encoder that we're trying to build here. And so what's the core challenge? The core challenge is that if we want this to be two-way, which means that you and I are talking to one another in 3D, we have to have some sort of display on the face, which covers the face, which means that we cannot have cameras look at it from the outside, right? Because the face is occluded. And so this is what an interaction would look like from outside. So uh, I was telling you that I believe in ghosts mm. and you don't because you believe in science. Yeah. So I think I watched too many ghost stories. I used to come home from school and watch, are you afraid of the dark? So you see like clearly uh, you can see a little bit of the face when he moves his head up, but generally the face is occluded. Um, and this has been actually a, a core a challenge with um, other approaches as well, where um, these interactions have been one way. Because the, the head, the, because the head would be occluded, uh, the, the meet mic method or uh, the one from Siren uh, and Digital Doug all have these kind of clear views of the faces and some direct measurements of the body, which, I mean, nonetheless, the results are, are highly impressive and, and it's, it's breakthrough work, but these remain uh, a one-sided asymmetric experience. So what we did is that we actually put some sensors into the, the headset itself, right? So we put some cameras that look at the, at the face so we, this is what the views look like. And these, there are these four cameras, one looking at each eye, one looking at the forehead region, and one looking at the, at the mouth. And um, it's, it's clear over here that you get some information right now, right? So we have hope. But it is this kind of very unusual, strange jigsaw piece of, um, of information that we have to somehow put together to get sort of a consolidated view of what's going on. And there is a sort of a hidden, like core hidden challenge here, which it's worth maybe like explaining quickly which is that machine learning methods work well when you have input output pairs given this produce that in other words supervised learning right so it's it's th th that's where machine learning methods tend to shine the problem is in this particular case we don't have that situation we can capture a bag of data which is the views of the eyes and the mouth we can also of course produce a lot of animations inside say mugsy of what the person's face is doing but at no point do we actually have ground truth, which tells us for these images of the eyes and the mouth, here's what the person's face is actually doing, because we can never get a clean view of it. So how do we solve this correspondence problem while learning the regression function between these two? And that's kind of like uh, the, uh, a core problem over here. And the way we approach this is uh, by using um, style transfer methods. So what we did is we said we want to learn this regression function between um, the, what the cameras see and what the code is, this encoder in other words. So we use the decoder. 
And with the decoder, because these cameras are IR cameras, that's necessary because the displays, uh, the cameras looking at the eyes uh, can't interfere with the, the display. So these are IR cameras. We do uh, an image style or a domain transfer that transforms this texture into uh, like a, a, a fake IR texture. And then using differentiable rendering, we render it from the perspectives of these cameras that are actually inside the headset. So you can see uh, this was the initialization, a neutral face. Her eyes are open, her mouth is open, whereas in actuality, she has her eyes closed and her mouth is closed as well. And so we define a loss between these two, a pixel-wise loss over here that tries to minimize the difference by, while optimizing this weight. So there is the encoder weights that we're trying to optimize. We're trying to optimize for these weights over here. And then we fix the decoder weights, do a domain transfer, and then uh, through differentiable rendering, uh, estimate this loss. And now let's look at this person's face as we run the gradient descent, right? And what you'll see is the loss will become smaller and her face will sort of like move. You will visualize gradient descent on her face as an expression. So you see over here, as I play this, she closes her eyes, closes her mouth. So that's one thing to observe. Now look at the, the loss function. Once again, similarly, as she closes her eyes, the error goes down. And finally, it's worth looking at these two. You can see again, as, as it sort of goes to, to the right location, Gradient descent forces her to close her, close her eyes. Let's look at a few other expressions as well. She opens her mouth slowly. In this case, the model over time does the same. She makes this expression. The model sort of like uh, uh, pursues the gradient down there and so on and so forth. And so this simultaneous solution of uh, correspondence as well as learning the mapping whips, this is kind of like the core uh, uh, innovation that we had to, to make to solve this question of how to build an encoder. And just to give a sense once again of metric telepresence, does this just look good or is it what the person actually meant to communicate? And we can see that here as we, as we sweep backwards and forwards, it lines up pretty well with the, um, with the raw video sensor, the truth produced by the video. Excuse me. All right, and so this is the real-time uh, real version. Right, and you can see the expressions are matching quite well. And so this is the whole end-to-end -end system, the encoder and the decoder uh, from the camera views to the code into the texture in the mesh. And then that gets rendered as this, uh, this model. And you can see again, the views are being changed, but this is the entire pipeline from end-to-end. -end. And in, in a real interaction, this is what it looks like. Hi, I'm Jason and I'm a research scientist at Facebook Reality Labs here in Pittsburgh. What you're seeing right now is my codec avatar, a digital representation of my face that captures my likeness in 3D, as well as my speech, my gaze, and my facial expressions. And, and so uh, this is kind of, once again, if we place that encoder function inside this um, simpli sim simplified sort of communication diagram, that's what it looks like. And once you see it end to end, that's the result we were showing earlier. So this is the, the sequence you saw earlier. This is what it looked like when these things were decoded. So uh, I was telling you that I believe in ghosts mm. and you don't because you believe in science. Yeah. So I think I watched too many ghost stories. I used to come home from school and watch Are You Afraid of the Dark? Every uh, day. Do you ever watch that show? Yeah, I watched it a couple times. I think I read some of the books too. They had books? Wasn't it? No, is that I Goosebumps? Goosebumps. Yeah. Did you watch that move? They made the Goosebumps move. And then this is another version as well, of course. Similarly, we're in different locations. And Have you told anybody about Yahtzee yet? What's Yahtzee? That's where we build a yacht and then we collect it oh, on a yacht. Oh, that's so clever. I like it. We yeah. should definitely do it. Now yeah. we must do that. I think we can trademark yeah. it. We have to. Yes. And, and now, clearly, of course, this is being shown as images on the screen. There's something very different about seeing these in VR, right? So if you see them in VR, and that person, the other person is there in front of you, there is this kind of switch in the head which tells you you're there with somebody else. And it becomes unbelievably uncomfortable. If you get too close, it feels like you're invading their, their personal space. It, it feels very real, even though at this point, it is, of course, just, uh, just the head that we have here. And so the last bit of this is, uh, which is ongoing research, is how do we actually share the environment, right? So we want to share the environment and say, can we relight the, the person based on where they are? And this is also like work that um, uh, several groups, particularly Paul Debevic um, at USC, uh, now at Google, have been pioneering uh, in terms of relighting. 
And uh, we've been looking at some of this as well to see if we can apply those sorts of uh, what, what are sometimes called in the community physically based um, rendering methods uh, with more sort of machine learning based uh, relighting methods, as you see over here. All right. So let me uh, conclude by just talking about a few uh, next steps. We're looking at improving eyes, the hair, uh, hands and bodies and audio as well to try to get to the full body impact. Right. So this is an example of eyes. Uh, that will be shown. This paper will be presented as SIGGRAPH this year. Uh, to get much more realism, this is this what you're seeing here is entirely rendered and it's uh, procedurally generated. Um, and then in this case, this is uh, hair reconstruction. And it's like once again, strand by strand accurate. You can see over here. Um, not just looks good, it actually we're attempting to make it uh, accurate. And then we, we use um, a learning method to render these sorts of um, many diverse kinds of uh, hair, hair types, thick hair, thin hair, long and short. Um, and then to, to capture full bodies, we have a specialized capture system. Uh, and in there, we can, in fact, um, uh, reconstruct like uh, full bodies as well. This so, is um, there's, a, there's a pipeline to reconstruct and analyze just like there was with the, with the full body, with the face. Uh, that you're seeing over here, segmentation, reconstruction, all of those things have been sort of maturing in the computer vision community over the last kind of couple of years. We've applied sort of the those in this in this particular setting. And here's our kind of like early result on full full bodies. We can load anything from clothing to equipment, weapons, training simulations, anything we need. Is it really so hard to believe? Sorry, this all right, so so that's what you see over there. That was entirely rendered. Uh, there was it was all all of those pixels were produced, and we're also now moving on to analyzing audio signals as well in three D. Specialized audio is, is important. Construct. It's our loading problem. We can load. And so with this, we can in fact reconstruct the audio field as well, and that's what you see over here. The audio field is reconstructed, um, meaning we can in fact simulate what a microphone would look like in any place in this space as well. And you can see like uh, over here. Um, this. It's a construct. It's our loading program. We can load anything from clothing to equipment. All right. And then he snaps his fingers, and you can see the wave sort of wave front emanate in the pressure field. So uh, that's sort of like where we are with the work. Where there are lots of open questions on how we can actually drive bodies, how we can relight them. And of course, as a system, how do we do all of this in real time? So this, this is an, as much an engineering uh, problem as it is as a research problem, as much a systems problem as it is a machine learning, computer vision, or a computer graphics problem, as much an audio research problem as it is a video research problem. So it's a very sort of multifaceted and open area, uh, both in the display, the sensor, and the algorithms. And so that's really maybe the, the, the message as a kind of like a future. Um, you know, using uh, machines as partners to see uh, they can help us maybe take the next step in this uh, evolution towards uh, communicating over distance uh, with telepresence. And I expect that this is one of the uh, major uh, areas that we're going to see. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for attention. And uh, um, this is work, of course, with an extraordinary team in uh, Pittsburgh. Um, thank you for your time. These are papers that we've used that we've published. Thank you, Yasser, for an inspiring talk. Continuing the topic of image generation and telepresence, uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Viktor Limpitsky. Viktor leads the Samsung AI Center in Moscow and is also an associate professor uh, in Skoltech. The past work of Victor spans a wide range of uh, topics in computer vision, machine learning, uh, for example, uh, object detection and domain adaptation. But most recent work of Victor is focusing on graphics, where his, his team has done some very influential work on uh, neural image generation. Uh, so we are happy to have Victor today with us uh, talking on few short neural avatars. And if you wish to ask questions to Victor during the talk, please do it in the comment section just below the, the video window.
Hello, uh, my name is Viktor Olimpitsky. I work at Samsung AI Center in Moscow and at Skolko Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, today, I will present recent advances with neural avatars that we have made with this wonderful team at Samsung. Yasser has made an excellent introduction to the topic of neural avatars before me. Um, avatars that use neural networks for rendering are getting very realistic and the avatars from his team are sort of uh, the gold standard in terms of realism and mimics accuracy. Uh, the remaining problem is that most neural avatar systems require a lot of video data of a particular person to create an avatar of that person. Or at least so it was a year and a half ago. So for the last year and a half, we've been working hard to address that. Last year, we have presented a few short system that uh, was able to create head avatars from few photographs or even from a single photograph. And there, the avatar was driven by facial key points, preferably the key points extracted from uh, the same person. And this uh, whole thing may be useful in various telepresence scenarios. Uh, under the hood, we had an architecture like this where uh, an embedded network was trained in parallel with the generator network. The embedded network would uh, look at one or multiple uh, or several photographs uh, of a person. Uh, it will map each uh, person, each photograph to an embedding space. If we have multiple photographs, we will average those vectors. And uh, then the resulting vector uh, was used to condition the generating process. The generator maps the rasterized landmarks to the image of uh, the avatar and um, the embedding vector is used to rescale and to bias uh, the activations inside the generator uh, during the generation process and in this way to inject the person specific information. Now it all worked uh, uh, but there were issues. First to overcome the identity gap uh, uh, it was needed to fine tune the generator to the training photographs. And that still required um, up to minutes on a desktop GPU. Furthermore, to run the generator network at sufficient frame rate, even at 224 by 224 resolution required a dedicated high-end GPU. We've got a lot of uh, popular press attention with animations like this but they also show the pitfalls. First, we see that the personalization was not ideal. For example, we, uh, we lost the famous Marilyn Monroe's mole. And thinking about the method, you could sort of understand why it was lost. It would be hard for the method for the embedder to allocate parts of the embedding space for all possible moles in all possible parts of the face. And even if it could do it, uh, it would be very hard to learn such mapping uh, without seeing lots of people with similar moles. And Marin Monroe's mole is sort of unique. Um, yeah, and um, also as we, said, as we said in the paper, to get such animations, uh, we had to carefully pick the driver key point tracks from people with similar face geometry to those celebrities. Otherwise, those animations would look bad. Um, so today I want to present several updates on few shot avatars. In part one of my talk, I will focus on head avatars and will present the model uh, that makes both inference and avatar creation process faster and feasible for mobile devices. Furthermore, uh, the model can achieve better personalization um, and I will also discuss how to make cross person reenactment possible. In part two, which will be smaller, I will focus on full body avatars and uh, our very recent results there. I will discuss a new neural model for full body avatars and I will discuss how future learning can be made possible for that new rendering model. So let me start uh, with the new head avatar model, which increases speed and personalization. Our new model comprises multiple steps uh, and it has more components than the previous one. As before, we input the source image and its key points into the embedder network and it produces a set of embeddings which encode the image. 
And in this case, uh, they are a bunch of tensors. So they are higher dimensional than before. We use these embeddings to predict the adaptive parameters of uh, two generators, the texture generator, which is the new thing, and um, the main generator, which we use at inference time. So the texture generator predicts a high frequency texture, uh, uh, which contains personalized details. Uh, notably, this texture uh, also has errors which may not be visible in the source image. And uh, the texture gener generator still predicts them. And this allows us to generate uh, um, per the person from new viewpoints. Um, so the inference generator is also conditioned on the embeddings via the same RDN connections. It takes as an input, not the rasterization, but the, just the vector of uh, face uh, key points. Um, so we don't have this encoding part to save uh, uh, the operations. Um, and uh, um, the generator outputs uh, uh, the low frequency blurry uh, uh, image of a person. And on top of that, it generates the warping field, which prescribes how should we warp the high frequency texture predicted by the texture uh, generator, okay? And the resulting image is composed of, uh, as a, is obtained as a sum of the two parts, uh, the uh, low frequency image and the warped texture image. Optionally, we can also ask the generator and the texture generator to predict uh, the segmentation uh, of a person to get rid of uh, the background and uh, also not to spend uh, uh, the modeling power on the background. So uh, if we look how it looks like with the uh, segmentation, this is how it works. So given the segmented input image, we first predict the high frequency texture using um, uh, the texture generator. And then at test time, given the driver, we extract the key points and then we predict uh, the low frequency image and uh, uh, the high frequency image uh, is obtained by warping the texture. And this is the output you see that we get a reasonably realistic result. Um, it, the mimics is subdued, but I will get to the point of getting better mimics uh, later. Uh, so importantly, uh, so the main thing is that at test time, we only need to run uh, the, main, uh, the main generator network, this one. And if you will look at it carefully, it uh, only predicts uh, uh, low frequency things. It predicts the low frequency smooth image and it predicts a smooth or a piecewise smooth warping field that we apply to the texture. The texture is high frequency, but the warping field is uh, quite smooth. Um, and the also option to predict the segmentation, but all these things uh, don't uh, have like uh, details. So we can make this generator network really small and really fast. And this way we can sort of go down to 40 milliseconds on Andreno 640 uh, mobile GPU, which you can find, for example, in Galaxy S10, which is a, uh, an ultimate uh, generation of, of flagship smartphones. Um, in the original system, we used the fine tuning of the generator by backpropagation for better personalization. It was slow and uh, really hard to port to mobile. Uh, so in the new system, we decided that we will learn a feed forward network uh, that looks at the training image. Uh, it looks at its um, reproduction by the network uh, initialized in the previous, uh, using texture generator and the embedder. And it looks at those two, it compares them and it back props uh, a simple loss, uh, something like pixel wise uh, loss into the texture. Uh, and then we learn an uh, updating network, which looks uh, at uh, the original high frequency texture and uh, the um, gradient of uh, a simple loss with respect to this texture. And it predicts the update or a series of updates uh, to the texture to improve the personalization. And when we train this feed forward network, we uh, make it to predict uh, such updates that uh, the out of sample uh, views get better. And when we measure this quality, we use the full loss, which includes perceptual terms, and adversarial terms. So at meta training sort of stage, we use uh, complex losses uh, 
to uh, update and to train this uh, updater network, uh, or we call it texture enhancement network. And uh, at, then at test time, or uh, more precisely, at the time of creating uh, uh, the avatar, we only look at the gradient of a simple loss, which is easy to backprop, and which we can, uh, and this this backprop we can easily implement on mobile device. So the whole updater network is essentially a feed forward network, which is uh, run for multiple few iterations and can be ported to the mobile phone. Um, and when we, when we train it, we enroll it for few iterations and we train it with more complex losses using the propagation. Okay, uh, and this is uh, co uh, based with some modification, the learn gradient descent idea and inspired by the deep view system. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, here you see an example with and without texture enhancement. Uh, and while the updates are subtle, uh, they, are, they are important for personalization and for the realism. We get these wrinkles, uh, we um, get uh, the garments better and overall the person looks more like uh, uh, himself with this uh, texture enhancement. Uh, here, uh, let me compare or show you some comparison results of our method with a very strong competitor, the first of the motion model that appeared at last uh, uh, new ribs. Um, so we retrained our, uh, uh, we, we retrained their architecture on our training set, also after pruning their uh, network to have similar complexity to ours. So it's a very strong competitor, but you can see that in terms of sharpness of hair and in terms of general sharpness, our method is uh, ahead, and this is uh, confirmed by the user study. So this is uh, one more comparison. So in each case, uh, so all models were run in a single shot mode. Uh, so we have single source photograph, and uh, then sort of tries to reproduce this uh, video by, uh, in our case, we'll only show the key points. Okay, so this is one more example. Okay, so the model I have just described uh, used facial key points to drive the animation. Um, and uh, using key points uh, um, come with uh, its own problems. Key points are person specific, so you cannot really drive another person like a, a celebrity with uh, uh, someone else's key points. Uh, and um, uh, also um, there is a, a limited degree to which key points represent the actual mimics. So to address this limitation, um, we learn new pose representation um, and we learn it uh, together with uh, um, uh, the whole avatar system. So we train a uh, whole thing on a big data set of videos and we use a uh, uh, solely Reconstruction losses, and we try to get pose, uh, um, get try to, to get good pose encoders based only on the construction losses. So in more detail, in more detail, we train in parallel two encoders, the pose encoder and the identity encoder, to which we show frames of the same video, and uh, and we do it for multiple videos. But in each episode, we show just frames from the same video. Um, and both encoders produce vectorial descriptors. Uh, so the pose encoder takes some frame uh, with some heavy augmentations and produces a vector which should describe its pose. And the identity encoder takes different frames from the same video, uh, extract vectors from each of them, and then average them to produce the identity embedding. Okay, and then the generation network uh, takes both of these embeddings and use the other in mechanism to condition on these embeddings and um, it tries to generate uh, the uh, frame plugged into the pose encoder without augmentations and also its uh, uh, segmentation mask. And the loss is obtained by comparing uh, um, the result uh, of the construction with the ground truth uh, frame that was input to the pose encoder and also the segmentations, the uh, obtained one and the real ones. So we use a different perception under serial losses and we train the whole system together, both the uh, all parts, the identity encoder, the poser encoder and the generator network. Uh, 
Um, we have found that our system learns post descriptors that are almost person agnostic. So there is not no person specific information extracted by the post encoder or almost no information. And all the person specific information comes from the identity encoder. And this is achieved solely by uh, using mimics preserving augmentations here. And also by uh, limiting the capacity of uh, the pose encoder network. So we use a smaller network for pose encoder and larger high capacity network for identity encoder. Okay. And in this way, the system tries to sort of pull all the person specific information through the identity branch. Here you see uh, uh, the reenactment, cross person reenactment results. Um, so here you see like uh, Igor Burkov, the first author of the, of the paper driving to a bunch of uh, celebrities and another celebrity driving the celebrities. And you see that uh, the mimics is uh, reasonably well preserved and also the identity of each animated person um, is also preserved. So there is like a very small leakage of identity from uh, the driving person to the um, uh, to the celebrity, which is a really hard to achieve. Um, so putting this all together, um, here is an example of uh, the bilayer avatar that runs on the new uh, pose descriptors. Uh, here it is in the self reenactment mode. Okay, so uh, this is a, a person driving the avatar created based on a photograph of her taken on a different day. Okay, so this is uh, the low frequency component predicted. Uh, and this is the warp texture component predicted. So this is the warping field predicted by the generator. Um, and when we combine, combine the two, we get uh, this result, which uh, sort of is fast enough to run on mobile. Uh, here is like a cross person uh, experiment where uh, the uh, same sequences in the previous frame is used to, to drive celebrity photographs and painting. And um, what you can see is that we really managed, I hope you can see it, that we managed to get uh, Marilyn Monroe's mole in this case. Uh, so by the way, this mole appears after texture enhancement network is applied. Before that, this mole is uh, not there. Okay, so uh, that was about the head avatar part. Uh, now let me briefly present some results that we have got recently for full body avatars. This is still very much work in progress, but I believe they, uh, they are interesting. Uh, full body avatars is in many ways a harder problem, especially if you want to be able to render the body from all possible viewpoints. You really need a good geometric proxy for this. And in this project, we pick the excellent deformable mesh model called Simple X from Michael Black's group and Max Planck. The problem with this geometric model, as well as with most other uh, models of this kind, is that uh, they only model human geometry without clothing and without hair. So to add clothing and hair, we use the deferred neural rendering idea from the Matthias Nessner's group in Munich. In the original work, uh, uh, they also show that uh, how it works for faces. So here we start with by checking that it can be expanded to the bodies. Um, so this is how it works. Uh, uh, the colors as well as the local clothing and hair geometry are modeled by uh, the so-called neural texture. The neural texture is a multi-dimensional image. Uh, we use 16, uh, 16 channels in our experiments. And here I visualize uh, the first three channels as uh, RGB. The texture is then wrapped around the simple X mesh using a Z buffer rasterizer such as OpenGL. And then the resulting image is processed by the rendering network to create a realistic view of a person. A note uh, that the loose cloth clothing and uh, hair is decoded by the rendering network and added uh, to the image. And then for the new pose, 
the network can reproduce uh, the new image. We can fit this model that is uh, the texture and the rendering network parameters to a large set of video frames of a given person or several given people in parallel because the Buju then have different textures. Uh, so we can do that simply by generating images, comparing them to ground truth uh, images, and then back propagating uh, the loss and updating the parameters of the rendering network and uh, the textures. Okay, this is how it works. Um, here are two examples of that. Uh, both of these avatars were created uh, from long videos of these two people who are engineers at our center. Um, and they share the same rendering network, by, uh, by the way, so that we can put them, render them together within the same scene. Here we show them in two different, well, disjointly uh, in different scenes um, in the context of augmented reality application. Um, and uh, they are animated by the motion of a third different person, which you don't see. Okay. Um, so these results are interesting. They're uh, they quite good, but um, uh, they used uh, video data to create those avatars. Those videos actually don't need to be very long. Uh, you know, short videos would, would do, but what if we want to create avatars from a single image or a few images? For that, what we do is we train a generative model of neural textures. And we do that by essentially taking the style gun model, its second version, and embedding uh, this style gun generator into our rendering model. So the style gun generates the neural textures and uh, those textures are wrapped uh, around sample X bodies, um, um, which are bodies fitted to real images in the data set. And then, oh, sorry. Uh, and then uh, um, we, for each sample texture, we create renderings uh, for two different body pose and camera positions. And we take those renderings, put them into our discriminator, which unlike style gun looks at two different images of the same person. And it tries to um, check if they really look as uh, two images of the same person. So it uh, checks both the realism and whether the identity is preserved between uh, these two images. Okay. We train our model on a large data set of TEDx talks, uh, about like 40,000 uh, talks. Unfortunately, it's, uh, while it's very diverse in terms of demographics and clothing, it also has limitations in, term, in terms of resolution and viewpoint coverage, as well as some very peculiar lighting distribution. It also very rarely shows people from the back. Uh, anyway, this is the best that we have uh, right now. And this is uh, uh, how samples from the model look like after, after training. These are non-cherry picked random samples. Uh, and this is uh, they, uh, the same like other non-cherry picked samples uh, wrapped over some LX bodies performing uh, some animations. Showed it to my wife yesterday. Uh, she said it looked like zombie apocalypse. Uh, I, I think these are actually quite nice people. Uh, I don't know what you think, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, zombie or not, the point of the generative model is not to generate samples, but to provide us a prior uh, onto neural textures uh, when we create avatars in the few short mode. So given a single or a handful of images, we can optimize the texture, not directly, but by tweaking to the style gun parameters, uh, uh, both uh, the style vector, uh, different style vectors, in different resolutions, and the parameters of the generator. So we optimize those two parameters, and uh, um, we try uh, to fit uh, the ground truth image. And we initialize the process by running uh, the pre-trained encoder, which maps uh, the image to the corresponding style vector and which we train on synthetic data. Okay. Um, it does not quite work in a single shot mode. Uh, you can see that uh, the segmentation is 
failing, most likely reason is the fact that we rarely see people from the back in TED Talks. So a good prior um, how a person can look from the back, given its front image, given her or his front image, is not learned. Uh, a better data set should make it possible. But in the eight short mode, when we're given uh, eight training uh, images, uh, the results are better. So we can create uh, reasonably looking avatars um, you know, from all uh, sides. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, this uh, is close or this is the state of the art for that kind of scenario. Okay, so to conclude, um, Neural avatars are a promising topic and few short generation of avatars uh, seem to be possible. Of course, there is a gap remaining with um, the best results obtained from videos from um, uh, a large amount of data in non-few short mode. And this seems to be a promising research direction. Uh, the quality of results in few short mode and in multi shot mode uh, mode, of course, depends uh, strongly on the training data set and collecting, mining, creating good data sets for this task seems to be a big part of the equation. Okay, so I will uh, leave you with uh, the references of the works my talk is based on. Uh, the last two are not published yet, but we will put them on archive soon. And this is the fantastic team that made it all happen. Um, so thank you very much for them and thank you. Thank you, Victor. I think this talk complements very well the previous talk of Yasser. Uh, and we can discuss them both at the end of the session. So if you have questions to Yasser or Victor, please put them in the question section below the video player. So our next talk continues the topic of image generation and uh, focuses on GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. GANs have been very popular in machine learning, computer vision, and computer graphics over the last years. But GANs are also known to be uh, hard to train. And uh, to reveal some news, new results in this space, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Artem Babenko, uh, who is a researcher at Yandex and has a PhD from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. Uh, in the past, Artem has done some notable work on large scale and highly efficient image retrieval. And today, Artem will talk to us on uh, how to find interpretable directions in the GAN latent space. So please welcome Artem and ask him questions online if you wish. Hi, uh, my name is Artem uh, from the Yandex Research Lab in Moscow. And today I'm going to talk about how one can interpret the state-of-the-art generative adversarial networks and what practical benefits one can achieve from this interpretability. Uh, first, I'll give a very brief uh, introduction to the current state of generative modeling. Uh, then I'll explain the existing techniques uh, for against interpretability, and these techniques are mostly fully supervised or self-supervised, which can be a serious limitation in practice. And finally, uh, I will present our very recent results on the completely unsupervised uh, again interpretability, and also give you an example when this uh, interpretability helps for certain uh, downstream tasks in computer vision. Okay, so let us start from the first, from the short intro to generative modeling. Uh, so generative models are basically uh, an effective way to represent uh, the manifold of the natural images. Uh, there are several families of generative models, for example, very popular uh, generative adversarial networks, which I will focus on in this talk. Also, there are several alternatives like uh, variational pot encoders and uh, flow-based models. And in fact, uh, all these methods, they uh, share uh, the same design in the sense that uh, all, all of them try to approximate uh, the complex distribution of uh, natural images uh, by a neural network, which inputs uh, uh, samples from a simple parametric distribution. Uh, 
uh, typically uh, standard uh, Gaussian distribution uh, is used. And the samples uh, that are called the latent codes of the generated images, and they are an important component of my talk today. So uh, the state of the art generative adversarial networks are quite successful in terms of approximating the distribution of uh, the real images. Uh, here you can see that uh, the uh, state of the art Bing gun and style gun uh, models are currently able to produce high resolution images, uh, which are quite difficult to distinguish from the real ones. And okay, uh, why do we actually need uh, high quality generative models? Uh, so, uh, there is a large number of reasons here. Uh, first, uh, they provide a compact representation of the uh, image manifold that can serve as a uh, useful prior for many computer vision problems like image restoration or super resolution. Second, uh, generative models can produce high quality synthetic data uh, to supervise discriminative models. Uh, and this can be interesting in uh, low shot or even completely unsupervised scenarios. And finally, uh, there is a large potential for image editing applications with manipulations in the latent space. And uh, I'll give you an example below. Uh, okay. Uh, since the first works on the generated adversarial networks, it was shown that uh, the uh, latent spaces uh, often contain uh, the directions that can be used for semantic image manipulations. Uh, you can see two examples of uh, directions uh, from the state of art began model on the slide. Here, uh, let us have uh, a latent code Z uh, that corresponds to an image of a dog uh, in the image space. And then if we shift this code uh, in the direction H sub one, uh, we can actually perform uh, zooming of this dog. Uh, another example, if we shift uh, this code uh, in the direction H sub two, uh, we can um, remove the background from the image. So basically H sub two is responsible for the background removal effect, uh, which is also a very useful image editing operation. Uh, these examples are the actual examples of directions from the big gun Latin space. Uh, so uh, actually at the moment, there is uh, enough evidence from the literature uh, that a wide range of such directions, directions exists. And uh, the main uh, question is actually how we can obtain them. Uh, since there is an infinite uh, number of possible directions in the Latin space, but uh, we are interested only in directions that are uh, first, interpretable, and second, disentangled, uh, meaning that they should affect uh, the only factor of variation to be useful in applications. Okay, uh, so, and uh, this is actually a very hot topic in the current literature, uh, both in machine learning and computer vision communities, and uh, there are two main lines of research here. Uh, the first line aims to develop uh, the models which latent spaces are disentangled by design, uh, which is typically achieved by additional terms in the loss function. Uh, the most no well-known examples uh, here are Infagan and uh, beta Valle models. But the problem here is that uh, this disentanglement uh, often comes at the price of generation quality. Uh, the images generated by these methods are much less realistic compared to the state of the art. An alternative line uh, just takes uh, the state of art uh, generative models, uh, which have exceptional quality, as you, can, as you have already seen, and uh, tries to identify the interesting directions in the latent space. And now I will describe uh, different techniques from this line. Okay, so. Uh, let me start from the completely supervised methods. And uh, the first idea here is to use uh, the label data to obtain the interpretable direction. Uh, I will demonstrate this idea by a simple example. Uh, okay. Uh, in this example, we have a generative adversarial network that produces the bedroom images. And our goal here is to obtain a direction that is responsible for the changing uh, the type of lighting uh, 
uh, indoor lighting or natural lighting. Uh, to this end, we are given two sets of images, uh, one of which is known to contain only indoor lighting images, and the other contains only the natural lighting, lighting images. So uh, these labels are effectively our supervision. Uh, then we can train a binary classifier from this data. And after that, we can produce a large number of uh, synthetic images with our generated adversarial network and use uh, the pre-trained uh, classifier to predict the labels. Uh, then we can assign uh, the predicted labels to the corresponding Latin code Z and find uh, the optimal hyperplane that separates, uh, you can see it here, uh, that separates the latent codes uh, of uh, natural lighting images from the latent codes of uh, the indoor lighting images. And finally, the normal vector, the normal vector uh, of this hyperplane uh, can serve as a direction uh, which is responsible for uh, change of lighting. So uh, effectively, uh, we just translate the external knowledge from the image space uh, to the latent space. Uh, so the idea is very simple, and uh, it was exploited in a large number of uh, concurrent works uh, very recently. It was shown to provide quite nice results, mostly for the phase generation papers, where uh, the state-of-the-art uh, state models are currently able uh, to modify poles, uh, smile, age, glasses, uh, and many other stuff. And uh, all these modifications are typically based on this technique uh, I have described above. Uh, another uh, very interesting work, which is also uh, based uh, on this technique, uh, has shown that uh, the latent directions identified in this way uh, can then be used to generate aligned pairs of uh, synthetic images that can be used to train feedforward image-to-image -image models. For example, for gender swap, as you can see in this example, and uh, some others. So uh, basically, uh, generated adversarial networks with uh, uh, discovered latent directions uh, allow to reduce uh, the unpaired image-to-image -image problems uh, to the paired problems uh, with aligned image pairs, which are typically uh, much easier to solve. Uh, another quite similar idea uh, from the last ICCV uh, is to use the pre-trained model to guide the image manipulation. So uh, basically, uh, this work finds uh, the direction by maximizing the score of the pre-trained model, uh, which predicts the image memorability. Uh, this direction can then be used to make a uh, generated image more memorable or more visually appealing, uh, and the results are quite impressive as well. Okay, uh, so supervised discovery of uh, interesting uh, directions in the gun latent space works quite well, uh, but it requires external supervision provided by the label data or the pre-trained models, uh, which can be a serious limitation in practice. Uh, therefore, uh, self-supervised methods that do not require any uh, external supervision are also of great interest. And uh, there is a recent paper from uh, SLR 2020 that explores uh, the self-supervised discovery of interpretable directions in the latent space of the state-of-art uh, generators. Uh, basically, uh, this work discovers the directions uh, corresponding to the uh, very simple image augmentations that can be produced uh, automatically, like uh, shifting or zooming. Uh, the idea is also very simple. Uh, they take a generated image corresponding to a latent code Z and uh, transform it uh, by certain augmentations. Uh, in this example, uh, it is a vertical shift. Uh, after that, they uh, optimize overall possible directions uh, W to minimize the mean squared error uh, between augmented image and the image corresponding to the shifted uh, latent code Z plus uh, W. And uh, the result of this optimization uh, for a large number of images is uh, the direction corresponding to the vertical shift transformation. Uh, yeah, on this slide you can see uh, 
uh, several examples of the directions discovered by this method. And um, uh, these guys show that uh, for many simple transformations like zooming, uh, rotation, or luminance, uh, the corresponding directions can be discovered uh, in the latent spaces of uh, state of the art models such as being gun and style gun. Okay, uh, so now I have finished with the overview of existing works, and you can see that uh, both uh, supervised and self supervised approaches are, may have limitations. Uh, in the supervised case, I have to provide human labels uh, that can be expensive to collect. Uh, in the self-supervised case, I am restricted only to uh, very simple image transformations, which applicability is probably limited, so maybe in applications these directions are not uh, interesting enough. And uh, uh, more importantly, in both scenarios, um, uh, we aim to discover the directions which we expect to identify. Uh, the existing approaches, they, uh, they just cannot discover something new and unexpected. So, um, and on this point, uh, I will move to our very recent results on the completely unsupervised discovery of interpretable directions in the latent space of a pre-trained uh, gun generator. So uh, let me start from uh, motivation behind our method. Uh, let us think, so uh, what do we actually want uh, from these interpretable directions? What directions are interesting to us, interesting for uh, downstream applications? Uh, in fact, ideally, uh, these directions should affect only a single vector of variation uh, to be useful in applications like image editing. But as you can see on this slide, uh, typical random directions in the latent space of, uh, let's say, spectral norm uh, generator uh, trained on NIST, uh, these directions, random directions typically uh, interfere uh, to each other, and uh, they uh, always affect uh, several factors of variation. Uh, so let us learn a set of directions such that the corresponding image transformations uh, uh, would be easy to distinguish from each other. So basically, uh, our, goal is, our goal is to obtain uh, the directions uh, which affect different factors of variation. And uh, uh, we, try, we will try to learn these directions uh, jointly uh, with a classifier, uh, whose goal is to predict uh, what direction uh, was used for a particular image transformation. And then uh, if uh, the accuracy of this classifier uh, is high, it means that the transformations are effectively different. And uh, we hope uh, that uh, they affect different factors of variation. Okay, uh, so uh, more formally, uh, on this slide, you can see uh, a scheme of our training protocol. Here, uh, capital G is a pre-trained uh, gun generator, which Latin space we are going to investigate, to explore. Uh, capital A is a learnable matrix of uh, directions H sub 1, H sub K. Uh, in our protocol, each uh, training sample is formed as a pattern code Z and uh, the shifted code. Uh, the shift is performed in uh, one of the directions from the matrix A with a random shift magnitude epsilon. So you, you see here a, a latent code Z when we uh, shift it uh, by um, in a direct, uh, random direction from matrix A with a random magnitude epsilon. Uh, then these two codes uh, are used as inputs to the generator, G, which is not able, which is non-trainable in our pipeline. And uh, an image pair is produced. For example, here we have uh, an image of a dog on a grass and uh, a transport image with a dog uh, without any background. And now uh, a learnable reconstructor, uh, capital R, aims to predict uh, what direction uh, and what shift magnitude were used to produce uh, the given image transformation. Yeah, that's basically it. Uh, and uh, both of the direction matrix A and the reconstructor R are learned jointly via stochastic uh, gradient descent. Uh, 
uh, and this can be done since all the components of the pipeline are fully differentiable. So that's uh, the main idea. Uh, and uh, on this slide, I just wanted to illustrate uh, how the image variation uh, along, a, along a given direction evolves uh, during the learning process. Uh, to make this figure, uh, we took uh, five snapshots of the uh, um, direction matrix A uh, from the different optimization steps. So uh, step zero corresponds uh, to the identity to the identity matrix A, uh, since uh, no learning were performed yet. And the last step corresponds uh, to the final, uh, final matrix of directions uh, after uh, convergence. Here, uh, we fix uh, a particular direction index k and uh, the latent code z. Uh, and each row in this figure contains the images obtained uh, by shifting the latent code z in the direction I, uh, hk with different magnitudes. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, before optimization, uh, the top row, uh, the direction affected uh, several factors of variation. And, uh, uh, then, as optimization proceeds, uh, it gradually uh, concentrates only on the digit thickness. And uh, after learning converged, uh, this direction is uh, completely interpretable. Okay, uh, well, now uh, I will show you several examples of directions discovered by our method uh, for different uh, GANs and datasets. For each data set, I will show only a subset of obtained directions since the total number is too high. Uh, okay, on the MNIST data set, uh, among others, we have identified uh, directions corresponding to the digit thickness, digit uh, width, uh, digit roundness, digit angle. And uh, no, please uh, note that it's not clear how existing techniques could obtain uh, such directions without uh, supervision. Now techniques uh, can do this. Uh, on the more interesting uh, anime faces dataset, our approach has discovered, uh, for example, simple, a simple red, a redness transformation and uh, more advanced uh, directions corresponding to uh, the hair direction, uh, eyeglasses, uh, and uh, even uh, naturalness uh, direction, which is very interesting. I, I believe it can be used in some editing applications. Uh, uh, in, the, in the Latin space of progressive GAN uh, that was trained on the Celebay dataset, uh, we have discovered uh, several directions uh, which are typical for uh, face, da face uh, images data, for example, amount of hair or uh, skin tone. Uh, actually, uh, similar directions uh, were uh, previously discovered by the existing methods, uh, but note that uh, we have managed to identify them without any supervision at all. Uh, in the latent space of BIGAN, uh, the state of art generative model trained on the ImageNet, uh, we have discovered several, uh, several known directions, such as luminous, for example. Uh, but we also discovered the directions uh, responsible for the background removal uh, that can be used to supervise uh, segmentation models, as I will demonstrate below. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, quantitative evaluation, uh, to measure interpretability is quite challenging. Uh, therefore, we use uh, two following measures which are proposed by, our, by ours. Uh, first, we measure the reconstruction classification accuracy. Intuitively, uh, high values of this accuracy reflect that directions are uh, effectively different and do not uh, interfere with each other. Uh, and second, we perform uh, human evaluation to assess uh, the interpretability of um, individual directions. Okay, so uh, where are the numbers? Uh, we compare our method with two natural baselines, uh, which are random directions in the latent space and uh, the directions which are aligned with the coordinate axis. In terms of uh, reconstruction classification accuracy, our method is uh, okay, winner. In terms of individual interpretability, uh, our method is also in, um, in the spectral, actually, in the spectral norm uh, GAN, uh, 
both random and coordinate directions are not interpretable, but on the uh, big gun, coordinate directions are nicely interpretable and only slightly less, uh, only, uh, only slightly worse compared to other methods. Okay, so, and finally, uh, I will explain how uh, our findings can be helpful for downstream computer vision tasks, yeah, practical benefits. Okay. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, an obvious application of the background removal direction is to produce the synthetic data for the salient object detection problem. On this figure, uh, the top row uh, contains the images generated by Pingan, and the middle row contains these images after the background removal transformation. As you can, <laughs> as you can probably guess, we can simply threshold uh, the pixel intensities to obtain a binary salience mask uh, for each image. And on these uh, pairs of image and mask, uh, we can train a simple unit model with pixelized cross, cross entropy loss and obtain the performance which is comparable to the state of the art on the ECSS data set. It's, it's SSD, uh, data set. Uh, but uh, a very interesting question is, uh, can we actually make uh, this salience detection method uh, completely unsupervised? Uh, Formally, uh, Big Gun is uh, weakly supervised because uh, uh, it was trained under supervision from the ImageNet class labels. Uh, but uh, our goal is to uh, understand if uh, this method can be uh, done completely unsupervised because uh, if it can, uh, a generic potential network will be able to solve a much more challenging problem of unsupervised segmentation. Uh, this problem is much more difficult, it is far from being solved. And the question is, uh, is this uh, class labels supervision necessary uh, for a gun uh, to distinguish between the object and the background pixels? And the answer is no, it is not necessary. Uh, guns can perform segmentation even uh, being completely unsupervised. To prove that, um, we have explored the latent space of the big big gun, which is an unsupervised gun trained on the internet. Uh, so it does not rely on any supervision and uh, is completely unsupervised. Uh, here you can see examples of directions discovered by our method in the Big Big Gun Latin space. Uh, actually, Big Big Gun doesn't contain exactly the background removal direction, but uh, it has another direction that can be used to differentiate uh, between object and the background pixels. Uh, so basically, the Big Bun, the Big Big Gun Latin space contains the salience lighting uh, direction uh, that makes the object pixels uh, much lighter. You can see it on this dock. Uh, it becomes almost white. Uh, and the background pixels uh, become much darker. Uh, so it's hard to say if this direction can be useful for some medicine applications, but it, of course, it can be used to generate salience masks. On this slide, you can see our scheme of completely unsupervised object segmentation. We have a non-labeled data set of images we want to segment. Then we compute the latent codes with the Gregan encoder. Uh, given these representations uh, that we obtain uh, the salience mask using the salience lighting direction and train the unit model using this mask, using these masks as a supervision uh, for generated images with simple cross-entropy objects. Uh, and uh, on three uh, saliency benchmark data sets, uh, we outperform the previous state of the art in terms of most of the uh, common metrics. And on two data sets, uh, it says SSD and DATS, uh, the margins of, uh, from our method are quite impressive. Oh, okay, so some quality examples are provided in this slide. Here, uh, green masks are uh, ground wolf provided by humans and uh, the red masks uh, are provided by our completely unsupervised scheme. So, yeah, I believe uh, they are very impressive. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, to sum up, uh, I have presented a completely unsupervised approach that can be used to identify the interpretable directions in the gun latent space. Uh, our findings uh, have also demonstrated that Genetic adversarial networks are very useful for unsupervised visual understanding problems such as uh, salience detection or object segmentation. Uh, and finally, uh, 
gun-based segmentations uh, currently achieves new uh, state of art for the unsupervised science detection problem. Okay, so that's probably it. See you on the panel discussion. Bye. Thank you, Artem, for an interesting talk. We'll have an opportunity to ask Artem questions during discussion. So computer vision has got out of research labs, we know this. So it takes place in our daily life, such as in cars and phones, but computer vision also becomes multidisciplinary. So in the first part of today, so we've seen uh, intersection, work on intersection between computer vision and computer graphics. And in the last talk of today, we will look at another domain where computer vision intersects with uh, robotics and manipulation. So with this, I'm very happy to introduce Abhinav Gupta, who is an associate professor at uh, CMU and also a research uh, manager at Facebook AI Research Fair in uh, Pittsburgh. Abhinav has done uh, a lot of work in computer vision and learning on analyzing vis videos, human actions, modeling 3D geometry of the scenes, modeling vision and language, and many other fields which we uh, talked about during the uh, three days of uh, Machines Can See. So recently, Abhinav has a number of, so uh, sorry, Abhinav has a, a high number of distinctions such as a PAMI Young Research Award and uh, several best paper prizes. So recently has done uh, some very influential work in robotics. And I'm excited to have Abhinav with us today talking on self-supervised curious robots. Welcome Abhinav and please feel free to ask Abhinav questions on the chat. Thanks for having me here. Um, so today I'm going, I'm going to be talking about uh, self-supervised curious robots. Uh, before I start, I think it's mandatory to just say that this work is mostly work of a lot of students and postdocs and research at CMU and research scientists and engineers at Facebook. And I'm just representing them here uh, with these ideas essentially. Okay, so I guess all of you guys know what's happening around in uh, field of computer vision and AI on the whole. Right. We have made significant advances in the last five or 10 years. And most of these advances have come thanks to uh, deep network, neural networks, uh, convolutional networks, or, and there are many names which people call them by. However, if you think, like we have made advances on these representation learning, but the learning paradigm is still quite narrow in scope. So let's look at how learning happens in uh, most of these fields right now. So let's start with computer vision. So in computer vision, how do we start do any kind of learning? So first we download millions of images from the internet. Um, then we label these images with dogs, mushrooms, uh, cats, and so on, like these classes of uh, objects that can be in them. And then once we have labeled these images, we learn uh, neural networks or convolutional networks such that they give the same outputs as what humans have labeled. Now this is supervised and passive learning. It's supervised because Humans have provided labels. Humans are supervising them via those labels. It's passive because the, the algorithm had no choice of what images it is going to see. We downloaded these million images and those are the images that it will see randomly one after another. Now let's look at another hot field, which is the field of reinforcement learning, uh, especially like Atari games and so on. Now, how does this approach work, right? I mean, so you basically, basically first choose your task. So let's say I want to do good on the breakout game in Atari. Then you define rewards. Um, so I'm going to get rewards if I kill these things or if I hit the, uh, these objects with balls and so on. And once you've defined these rewards, you basically uh, perform reinforcement learning. So you basically try actions and see what maximizes your rewards. Now, remember, we use millions of iterations, like tens of millions of steps before we can actually learn anything meaningful here. Um, and what we learn is just how to solve that, that same task, essentially like breakout game and so on. In some case, in most cases, it will not transfer to any task, but in some cases it might transfer to real robots. Like if you're training in simulation and it transfers to real robots, if the object is exactly similar, there's no uh, diversity in objects. 
Now compare this style of learning that we have been doing, where we have either the labels or the tasks, rewards. Compare that to how humans learn. Now in the case of humans, we do not get this kind of labels themselves, right? We basically have, uh, we mostly learn in an unsupervised or self-supervised manner. Um, and the scale is much different, billions of images and so on. Uh, especially I think if you compare, um, there is no labels like the, the cats and dogs and there are no task rewards. Everything is learned in an unsupervised or self-supervised manner. Secondly, in case of humans, uh, the learning is much more physical in nature. Uh, you, we are living in the world, we, we are basically interact with things, we touch things, we play with things, and that helps us to learn uh, about the world that we live in. Third, the learning in human is not passive in nature. Uh, and in fact, it's very active. We as humans define, desire, what data do we want to get next? Uh, so right now I want to learn how to throw objects. So I will now start throwing objects and see uh, how, how objects behave under this throwing action. This ability to get active data, like decide your own data points is very, very critical in the case of humans. Uh, fourth, we are not learning one model for audio, a second model for vision, a third model for NLP and so on. We are basically taking all the information that we can get from vision, speech and so on. And we learn one integrative model and we are not solving one task. We are trying to solve lots of tasks at the same time. And finally, in the case of humans, we are not just doing one short learning. We basically keep on learning uh, throughout our lives. And in fact, we reuse whatever we have learned in the past to learn new things every day. And so the learning is much more lifelong in nature. But I would say forget all these reasons. There's one reason why current approaches will not scale. Uh, and that is, um, for example, look at how much data can computer vision approaches use. So ImageNet has 1 million uh, bounding boxes that were collected over five years. Compare this to how like Facebook has more than 600 million images uploaded daily. And in, in fact, this is a pretty old number uh, right now. Um, now in terms of actions, uh, most of these approaches are basically learning in simulation. They saw, learn to solve one task, for example, a breakout game or any other game. You first decide the task, and then you take tens of millions of iterations to solve that task. Now, in the case of uh, humans, we are solving thousands of tasks every day. I mean, even babies can do thousands of different tasks, um, even though they are still learning in the learning phase. So clearly, this approach is not scalable. So what my research has been focusing on is to try an alternative approach. The alternative approach is to build self-supervised uh, curious robots that will learn by experimenting in real physical world. Um, and so the three key terms are self-supervised, curious, and physical world. And I'll basically be talking about all these three terms in the talk, essentially. But essentially, what I'm trying to, what my research has been trying to do is trying to build robots that can learn like babies. And I'm think, saying it is in a very loose term. I mean, of course, we do not know how exactly babies learn and so on. But the inspiration is basically how humans have cognitive development. That's exactly how we want to build our systems and make our systems learn. Now, in the case of babies, clearly there's not one stage of learning. There are multiple stages of learning that happens in the case of babies. Um, so for example, we first start with passive learning. Uh, so we basically, in passive learning, we basically are observing the world around us. This is a stage when baby has not yet started interacting with the world. It's observing, it's in the lap of their parents and it's observing what is happening around it. Now, in this case, baby does not have too much control over the what data it's going to see. And that is why this is passive. So a lot of learning happens at this passive stage. Next, baby start doing action. It started interacting with the world. It plays with objects and so on. But initially the actions are random. I mean, it's not, does not, it's not trying to experiment with the world and so on. And so that's the second stage of learning. The third stage of learning is more active exploration. Now baby has already started learning models of the world. So it wants to decide, okay, this is the next thing it wants to try. It, the baby sets its own goals and tries to achieve those goals uh, essentially. And so this stage we call active exploration stage. Now after around nine month or uh, nine to 12 months uh, stage, babies start imitating. And so imitation basically becomes one of the critical stages where baby sees its parents or what, whoever is around and tries to imitate the actions that they do. And so this is the fourth stage. And finally, the fifth stage, which is a much more complicated stage is a social stage where baby is learning with other babies, for example, in daycares. And baby is now much more interacting with parents, right? I mean, it basically tries to get the right supervision uh, by, in, by communicating with parents essentially. And so these are the five stages that happen. In, these, in this talk, we are going to focus on the first three stages and we are not going to look into 
the last two stages of learning. So the first, what I'm going to start with, how can you learn good visual representations from lots and lots of data? Um, and so the goal is we want to use lots and lots of passive data. This could be images and videos, and we want to scale it up. We want to learn it not on million images like ImageNet, but we want to learn on hundreds of millions of images. Uh, and so that's the first part of the talk that we are going to look at. How can you scale up uh, self-supervision via self-supervision? But of course, uh, as I said, passive is not the way, only way to learn. And if we think in case of babies, this is what most of the times learning look like. Interacting, physically interacting with the world, throwing things around, poking things, putting things in the mouth and so on. And so the next stage, we are going to talk about how can you develop systems that can physically interact with objects and learn about the world? And so this is more like scaling up robotics right? because physical interaction means we need to have robots and we want to scale up by robotics such that it can collect data in the real world environment and solve real world tasks and hardware. But in the first, in the second, initial second stage, we are just going to do random actions. And the last stage, we are going to basically develop models of curiosity uh, and synergy. And so at this stage, what we are going to try to do is the robot is going to decide what data it wants to get. Next. Instead of doing random actions, it will basically build a curiosity model and it will try to do things that the curiosity model tells it should do next, essentially. And we are going to show that in by having this active exploration, we can learn much faster than uh, random uh, things. So this is the three parts of the talk um, that I'm going to go through uh, in this uh, thing. Okay, um, so let's start with the first part, uh, which is how can you scale up learning via self-supervision, uh, essentially. And so um, in recent work, in recently there has been a lot of interest in self-supervised learning. And so the idea is given lots and lots of images, we want to learn representations without using any supervision of dogs and cats and like humans are not labeling anything here. So the key question is how do you get supervision? Now most of the self-supervised learning approaches get supervision by hiding uh, some of the data and trying to predict that hidden data. For example, you can have colored images. You can hide the color of it. You can show the black and white image to the uh, neural network and ask it to predict color. Now you do know the answer here because initially the image was colored. So the neural network has to now learn how to predict colorize, predict how to color this image and the supervision comes for free because you already had a colored image. Similarly, you can hide other things. For example, you can hide the middle pixels here uh, in the image and try ask the network to predict these hidden deep pixels essentially. Or you can look at the first three frames or try to predict the fourth frame in a video. Uh, again, if you, are, you have hidden the fourth frame, you're not showing the fourth frame to the neural network and you're asking it to predict it. Um, in our work, we have basically tried two main common approaches, which is first, trying to hide the spatial layout. So for example, we will show you these two patches of a bus, right? I mean, on the left and the, on the, the blue and the green, uh, the red patch, and then ask you to predict the relative spatial layout, like how are they configured with respect to each other? Um, we make the problem easy. For example, we can say that the left patch is in the middle and the right patch has to be on the bottom right of this, uh, essentially. And the way you are solving this task is by creating this, uh, like recognizing that this is a bus. So this is the relative spatial layout. Now, in this case, we hide the ground truth because, because we are only showing you the patches, but the patches are coming from real images. So we do know uh, what the right answer was essentially. Uh, in another approach, we have tried to uh, use tracking information. Like you can basically hide the time temporal thing and then ask to predict the time-based constraint essentially. Now, I was just basically giving a brief overview of like how self-supervised learning appro approaches work um, in terms of algorithms. In terms of experimentations, whenever these approaches try to show they work, what they do is they take the current data sets. For example, they'll take ImageNet, which has both images and labels. They will drop the labels and then try to see, can you just learn a good representation uh, from these 1 million images of ImageNet essentially. Um, now, now this sounds great, right? I mean, you have basically can test it against supervised algorithm because you have the right uh, label and so on. But it misses the real point. And the real point was that the reason we are trying to do self-supervised learning is so that it can scale up, right? Because we do not need tables. You do not now need to just use one million images. You can use billion images, trillion images, all the images on the web you can use because they do not need any supervision anymore. And so, um, so while these self-supervised approaches um, have been shown to work 
somewhat, they are still far from supervised learning, essentially. And the reason we are capably, uh, uh, we are basically behind is one of the possibility is that we are not studying the scale. We are not scaling up these self-supervised approaches. We are not trying them on hundreds of millions of images. We are still trying it on one of million, one million images and so on. So in the first work, what we tried to do was we tried to study what will happen if you try to scale these self-supervised system to 100 million images. Um, maybe that will help us scale up the performance uh, essentially. Um, and so this is the first work that we are going to focus on. Um, just to highlight, so we are using two self-supervised approaches. We are instead of using, um, we are going to show the results on two. So one, first one is the jigsaw one. So in this case, we basically take an image, extract some patches, we jumble them up, and then we ask the computer to solve the uh, jigsaw puzzle essentially. And so it has to rearrange these patches so that it can get the right configuration of these patches. And the second task that we have used self-supervised approach that we are going to use is the image colorization. So we take a color image, we hide its color, and we ask the uh, computer to predict the color uh, in this scenario. And so these are the two approaches which we are going to try to see what will happen if we scale them up to 100 million images, because most of these approaches have only tried scaling up to 1 million and that's it. Now, apart from scaling on the data access, so I have been talking about scaling on data access, like what happens if you go from 1 million to 10 million, 50 million, and 100 million. There are two other accesses where you can scale them up. The second axis is the model access. So what if you try to learn more powerful model, like ResNet 50 or ResNet 101 and so on, how will these more approaches perform? Um, hopefully, as the model's size increases, it should be able to extract more and more juices out of this uh, data, essentially. And the last axis that we are going to compare on is problem complexity. So this axis is kind of interesting. Um, when you're trying to solve these self-surprise approaches, you can make your task harder and harder. So for example, in Jigsaw, um, you can say that there are only 10 possible permutations, or you can say there are 100 possible permutations in which you might have to try this, uh, rearrange these patches and so on. So based on how many permutations you allow, the problem becomes harder and harder. And so that's this problem complexity axis, where we are going to make the Jigsaw problem harder and harder and see how does the representation learning work in this on this third axis, essentially. So let's start looking at the data access first. Like what, what kind of results do we get if we scale up on the data access? Um, so what we tried was we basically uh, took these, uh, we take AlexNet and ResNet 50, and we train both Jigsaw models uh, on these uh, Jigsaw and the colorization model with these uh, network architectures. And we are going to scale up the size of data. We are going to go from 1 million to 100 million and see how the performance varies. So if you look in AlexNet, it starts to increase as you are adding more and more data, but then it starts saturating. But when it comes to uh, ResNet, it basically starts getting more and more performance. And in fact, by going from 1 to 100, it almost get, gets 10 uh, points more performance, essentially. Similarly, image colorization, again, as you scale up more and more data, the performance keeps on increasing. So that is kind of good news for us, right? I mean, we are going to 100 million, but remember, this is self-supervised learning. You can just keep on scaling it up. You can go to billion next uh, next step and so on. So this is kind of good news in the sense that these approaches seem to be scaling up. So we should be basically adding more and more data, as much data as we can. Um, the other thing is, as you see, the gap between these two approaches is starting to increase, which means these larger capacity models are able to extract more and more juice out of this data. And so the first conclusion is we should try to train higher capacity models with these approaches and they should be able to scale, at least it seems like. Okay, next we want to check how would it perform on problem complexity, uh, like if we make problem harder and harder. Now in case of Jigsaw, what we are seeing is as you start making the problem harder and harder, you allow 5,000 different permutations or rearrangements. The performance keeps on increasing, but then starts saturating. Um, similarly, on AlexNet, as you add more and more permutations, the performance, the representation learning improves uh, further and further, essentially. And so this is, again, I, I would say good news, but it's kind of interesting that if you try to predict, there's a whole range of spectrum of what you can hide and what you can predict. So in, on the end of the spectrum, you can completely hide all the pixels and try, and this is something like a uh, predictive prediction-based approaches do. They try to predict all the pixels, and that is the hardest problem. You're predicting too many bits of pieces. So maybe that is not the right solution here because we start seeing some saturation. On the other extreme, you can just predict whether the image is rotated or not or something like bit, only bits of information. That also doesn't seem to be the best. So somewhere between lies the right trade-off essentially is what basically this is suggesting. 
uh, to us. The last thing we want to see is what will happen if you scale all the three axes together. So you're getting some improvements from problem complexity scaling. You're getting some improvements from data scaling, but are these complementary? is the question maybe we want to ask here. Maybe uh, they're not complementary, and they're just basically when we'll combine both of these things together, we will not see gains anymore. Um, and so thankfully that's not the news that both the axes are quite complementary. The gains we are seeing are complementary. So if you combine, but like if you increase both model complexity and the model size, the performance keeps on increasing. And so that's again a good news that scalability seems to be there in these approaches completely. Now where they are in terms of performance. So right now it seems like supervised and self-supervised approaches are almost similar when it comes to tasks like object detection and so on. Um, but um, so in, it turns out that self-supervised approaches are competitive or better when it comes to object detection, 3D scene understanding, visual navigation, tasks which are less semantic but more require fine-grained understanding and so on. But when it comes to more semantic tasks, for example, classification and low short learning, there's still a big gap between the self-supervised learning and supervised learning, and there's a direction to go. Uh, we have to basically start seeing like how do you improve in this axis essentially. Okay, so that's the first part, which is uh, scaling of self-supervised learning. Um, next, we want to see how we can improve the learning. Like, I mean, we need more supervision here. Uh, clearly, at least it, right now, it seems that there is still a gap in some of these uh, algorithms uh, on classification and low short uh, classification and so on. So how do we improve? Well, as I said, the learning in humans is more like this, right? I mean, our physical interactions are very crucial in case of humans. So we want to next explore, can we use these, can we build agents that are not just learning from passive images from the internet, but actually interact with the world and learn visual representations and uh, by physically interacting with objects. However, physicality is not that easy, right? I mean, physicality is hard. Um, so for especially the big question that we have in front of us is, can we can robotic scale? Right, because I, for now I was talking about one million million images, hundred million images, and so on. Now, collecting hundred million examples with robots is very, very hard. In fact, up 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 until few years ago, the biggest robotics data sets were few thousand examples at most. And so, the first question we want to ask is: Can robotics actually scale? Can we get the amount of data that is comparable to what we can get via passive uh, data? I think it is clear that. Uh, you will not get as much data as passive because even humans, like we are seeing much more passive data than uh, interactive data. But the order of the, we are talking about the order, right? Can we get, at least get 100,000 examples from uh, physical data is the kind of question we want to ask. So as a first step towards that, we wanted to try something simple. Let's see in a grasping setup, can we scale up robotics essentially? So we build a simple setup. So you have a robot in a tabletop setting. So here's a robot. And basically what it does is it chooses a random location on a table. It goes and tries to pick up at that location. So here it chose this location. It tries to go and grasp object at that location. It fails. Next, it tries a second random location. It goes and tries to grasp. Um, and because it is random, it will fail a lot of times. But when it is successful, it can measure the success using the force sensor on the wrist. And you see the face turn happy here. Um, so whenever it's going to be successful, it can know that it was successful in grasping. So the data is getting labeled by the four sensors in the wrist, uh, essentially. Now we did this not one time, not two times, but uh, 50,000 times. And we basically ran robot for 16 hours a day for 700 hours continuously to collect this large scale data. I want to highlight that this paper, when it was published, this data was uh, one order of magnitude more than in any of the other papers in, robot, in the field of robotics, essentially. And once we have 50,000 uh, examples, you can now try these higher capacity models like deep networks to solve these tasks, essentially. And so we basically train a deep network to predict the grasping. So if you are basically testing on completely new objects you've never seen before, you get 66% uh, performance. If you are get, seeing on seen objects, you get 73%. But the interesting thing is that the performance start increasing with data again. As you add more and more data, performance increases. It starts saturating around 20 to 40,000 uh, mark here, but that is just because the variety of objects is limited, right? You're collecting at one lab, you basically start running out of diverse objects. So this is one of the issues here, and I'm gonna talk about it later in the slide, like how do you get more diverse objects? When you're scaling up on the data access, you need to get diverse data. You cannot just keep getting more and more data with same objects. 
and you can also do things interesting things like clutter cleaning. So on the bottom, you can see how the robot is cleaning the clutter on the table. Uh, and these are completely novel objects not seen before. Like some of them are novel, some of them are seen, but uh, the robot can basically do this interesting task like clutter cleaning. So that was interesting. So for the first time, we could show that you can scale up uh, learning with these large scale data in robotics. And the interesting part was that by just scaling up data and using something very simple like a standard neural network approach, the approach seems to work really good, reasonably good. I mean, this is a kind of generalization that is very hard to get in robotics, like training on the objects in the right and then trying to grasp the objects on the left. So then that inspired us to see, okay, can we do some kind of navigation also uh, in this kind of self-surprise manner? Again, the idea is collect lots of data in the real world and then use a simple neural network to just do the policy uh, essentially. So how would we do this in drones? We basically build a drone whose goal was to just go and collide into objects. So it randomly goes and collides into objects. So, and this drone collided not one time, not two times, but 11,000 times in 20 different environments. It basically goes to a height, chooses a random direction, and then goes in this random direction until it collides with the object. And it records like at what point it collided, it's recording the video as it's colliding and so on. Um, so once you have uh, data, uh, we just simply label it. So as you are far away from the collision, you call it positive data. As you are close to the collision, we call it negative data that this is a bad thing to do. And in the middle, you call gray zone. We don't know whether it's good or bad essentially. So what this we have ended up collecting is all the a lot of negative data, right? I mean, because this is all these collisions show this is how a drone should not fly because otherwise it will collide in the, in the thing. And so then by using this simple approach, we basically learned a neural network, uh, which tries to predict whether you should, you're going to collide or not. And if you're going to collide, whether you should turn left or right. And so this is a simple unseen environment before. So here's a drone flying in the Wien Hall in CMU. It basically recognizes that there's a glass door in front. So it's going to collide. And so then it turns left in this scenario. Here's a much harder example where there's a very narrow hallway. We in fact made it narrower by putting some chairs around it. And again, the drone basically recognizes that um, it's going to collide with the chair. That's why it turns left. And then again, it was going to collide with the door. So it turned back and so on. And again, here you can see as soon as it predicts collision, it either turns left or right, depending on where it's less likely to collide. Now, during our training, we were we even had students around in the lab and the drone collided with the lab uh, students. So it knows how to avoid uh, humans as well. So it was going to collide with this uh, student who was walking in the hallway. And so it avoided basically colliding with it because it has seen this negative data uh, as well. Okay, so the first, as first step, we thought, okay, can we collect data at large scale with these robotics approaches? And it seems we can do it. So that's good. So it's a good news essentially. But the next question is, can we learn some good visual representations via these uh, data sets? So we, what we ended up doing was we collected large scale data for grasping, pushing, and poking, these three different actions. And then we didn't train a neural network that tries, given these images, tries to solve these three tasks of grasping, pushing, and poking. Um, and what we are going to do is, since the visual part is same, we are basically going to check if this, the visual representations that we learned to solve this task, are they good for solving image tasks, for example, image classification, image retrieval, and so on. And it turns out we found out that this physical task can actually help us learn good representations, especially for instance retrieval uh, in this scenario. And doing variety of tasks, not just doing one task like grasping, but doing multiple tasks helps a lot. It's critical to do not just one task because otherwise you will overfit. But again, in this physical world, as I said, you start to saturate much faster because you are basically learning probably in just one environment, in like your lab environment. And the amount of the, the while you can keep increasing the data size, the diversity of data increases. And so there's a still a long, long way to go if you have to use physical learning for uh, physical data for visual representation. Learning. And, the, and, and as I said, the big problem is a diversity problem. We have this diversity issue completely. So why is this diversity issue? So if you look, most of the lab setups look like something like this on the left. Now, in the interesting thing here is it's not, not only non like so, so much less clutter, but it's so biased, the lab setup, that by just by looking at the image, I can tell you where the image comes from, for example. So if you're using this kind of a green cloth, this color green cloth, 
I can tell you that this data, in this data set, the images are coming from Berkeley because Berkeley data sets all have green cloth uh, in, on their tables. And if it was a white cloth on the table, then it would be coming from CMU. So this is the kind of amount of bias that exists in current approaches. On the right are some simulation images. And you can see simulation images do not look real at all. So as a next step, we want to increase diversity of data. We just don't want to collect data in labs or simulation. We want to actually take robots in their natural habitats, which is homes. By collecting data in home, we should be able to get much more diverse data. But of course, people are going to ask, are we even ready to move into homes, right? I mean, robotics does not work. So what will we do in homes? So there are two big problems here. Current robots are too expensive to bring into homes. Current robotics is too brittle. It's not useful for any task, so we cannot really, uh, these robots are not going to be useful at all. So to solve both these problems, we basically came up with the solution. So for the expensive problem, we build this low cost, we assemble this low cost robot. So this robot costs only $4,000. Uh, it has an arm, it has a mobile base. And basically it's like a simple robot and we basically can help us to scale up data collection at much larger scale than ever before. Now there's a second problem, which is the brittle problem, which still exists. Like current robots are too brittle. They're not going to be, no one is going to buy a $4,000 robot that does nothing essentially. So how do we still get these robots into homes and collect diverse data? Now here we have a chicken and egg problem, right? Because I will not have good robots until I can collect diverse data but I cannot collect diverse data until I have good robots. So now we have this chicken and egg problem. This, uh, so how do we solve this chicken and egg problem? Well, it turns out that in Pittsburgh, uh, it's very cheap to rent Airbnb homes. Uh, Airbnb home costs only $75 per night. And so that's what we did. We basically started renting homes on Airbnb. We would take our robot, collect data in that home, which will again give you diverse set of data. We will take a few objects of our own, but then take the most of the objects from the house and then start uh, collecting like the grasping data from uh, from that environment essentially. Now this kind of tells us, right? I mean, for it's so easy to get diverse data by just to, you spending seventy five dollars per night. And once you have lots and lots of diverse data, you can now train your model with this diverse data. Um, of course, the, one of the issues is because we made our robots cheap, they're no more that precise in their control uh, setup. So we basically have now two networks. One network which is where where to grasp. The other network predicts uh, the noise in the control actuation part essentially. So it says that if you're trying to go at uh, this location, the hand will end up at this location. So it's modeling uh, how the hand is going to be behave uh, in under noise essentially. And by modeling noise separately, you can now basically uh, learn both the noise and the grass prediction essentially. And so it turns out that by using this uh, data, we do get significant improvement like the model learns significantly better than using just the lab data alone. In fact, it turns out that if you train on home data and test it in lab, that works better than training on lab and testing on lab. This is very different from how standard machine learning things work. And in machine learning, if you're training and testing in similar environment, you would end up getting much better boost. But because the data in the lab is very restricted, you tend to overfit much faster. Whereas in home data, it's much harder to overfit, um, essentially. Um, now, the other thing which, which I really like to talk about here is that not only you can have transfer across environment, but you even have transfer across hardware. So we use the home data, which is collected on this cheap ro robot, and we tested it on much more uh, industrial robot like a Baxter. Um, and we, it basically transferred to this robot uh, as well. So that is kind of very exciting was in generally in robotics, uh, it does not transfer across hardware. And for the first time we are seeing transfer across hardware uh, as well. Okay, so um, we we are basically starting to show that you can collect diverse data at scale. And we are should, starting to show that with lots and lots of data, even in physical world, you can actually learn good representations as well. But until now, most of our exploration has been quite random, right? I mean, I said the robot goes and picks a random location and goes and tries to grasp at that location, uh, essentially. And so because this exploration is random, we still do not have control at collecting this data point essentially. So the last part of the talk, I want to basically talk about how the uh, robot can collect data at scale uh, uh, by selecting its own data points. And interestingly, there has been some work on curiosity. Um, basically uh, these RL agents try to model, like use visual prediction to figure out what object 
uh, what action they should try next essentially so if you cannot predict something you want to try that action uh, essentially but even these curiosity visual prediction based curiosity approaches take tens of millions of iterations before they can learn anything meaningful and the reason is because when you're trying to do this visual prediction you have to basically model the environment and in because environment we do not know what is the exact function of our environment how does environment behave we have to treat it as a black box and so that's why we have to use these approaches like reinforcement learning uh, to solve this problem now in, instead of trying to use this reinforcement learning which is very sample and efficient in this paper we try to go with more self surprise exploration so the idea is pretty simple instead of trying to use one model for prediction we are going to now use n models for prediction and instead of trying to reward things where where we cannot predict next we now start rewarding uh, when the models do not agree so we want to explore that part of the space where the mod visual prediction models do not agree with each other essentially so if i have n mod three models and all the three models do not agree what will happen when i push this object this is the thing i want to try because if i know enough about the environment all the three models should predict the same thing uh, about same uh, thing about the action essentially and so this simple idea um we tried now interestingly this is not dependent on environment anymore it's only dependent on those three models and all those three models are differentiable so we can basically back prop all the way through essentially and so we tried this exploration on the real robots so here is uh, the random exploration if you are not this is what basically what i presented in the second part of the talk you pick a random location and you try to do things at random location essentially uh and if you try a curiosity based model uh in just 1200 examples you will see that the robot will try uh, interesting things the video is not okay the video is not so yeah so so this robot has just only done 1200 rounds of training and you can see it's already doing very interesting things like pushing around objects picking objects then it will push this around so it kind of tells you that we are able to do uh, learning much more sample efficiently just by picking up our own data points this is something that we plan to do uh from before now but still i mean we can show at 1200 iterations or five few hundred a thousand iterations you can do interesting things but what about complicated behaviors like opening a bottle will stick to still take millions of iterations because before you can we study the actually learn the exploration bias so um in this scenario what we try to do is we basically uh put more regularization we basically try to reward uh complicated behaviors like if two arms are interacting with each other we reward if these two arms can do things that were not possible by doing with a single arm and so we want to do to see if we can with these kind of curiosity can we do things like bottle opening ball pick up box doing and so on and as you can see by just rewarding actions which are only possible with two arms and not possible uh with one arm you can see that very interesting behaviors are starting to emerge for example on the left you can see the bottle is being able to open on the right the ball is able to pick if a single ro robot goes to pick a ball the bottle slides away as a ball slides away fox through the thing uh, long bar pick up again they are able to learn um and so apart from doing this one of the interesting things is you can even transfer them to real robot very simply easily and so here is the transfer of these uh, by manual manipulation task on real robots uh so this is ball picking task you can see one hand tries to hold so that it doesn't slip away similarly in this case one bot hand holds a bottle the other hand basically goes rotates you do see ar markers but these ar markers are only used in training they are not used in test at all uh they are used for just making sure the reward is like evaluating performance uh, essentially and so you can again see that you can actually do very interesting behaviors and this has been learned for much less iterations like i think 10000 iterations only um and so the point here is that again active exploration and having some predefined uh notions of interestingness kind of will make it easier for your models to learn essentially okay so i think this is almost the end of my talk um i do want to spend like couple of minutes uh on democratization like one of the biggest problem with robotics is that and so if as we are moving from computer vision more and more people want to do embodied vision rather than just computer vision of like by downloading images from the internet however it is it turns out that doing embodied stuff or uh, robotics is very very hard right because uh, robotics is 
it's there's a high entry barrier like when i went into robotics it took us two years before we could do anything important interesting with a robot so that is why we have built this pi robot platform and i want to publicize this like it's an open source robot robotics research platform with this platform you can do things like manipulation navigation and like collect demonstrations and so on um it's very easy to download it's very nicely it's the its interface is much cleaner than uh, what you have seen in go so it makes robotics accessible to people who are not like expert in robots and even vision people and machine learning people can do it so pyrobot is basically an ecosystem it all not only has this light interfaces to solve things like if you want to do manipulation tomorrow like grasping tomorrow it can be done with like this five lines of code in, in pyrobot but apart from that we also have are trying to build a lot of algorithms so like if you want to compare to baselines all the there are a lot of implementations there are a lot of data sets uh, available online for on pyrobot uh, website and that will help us to scale it a bit better it's kind of whatever pytorch did for uh, deep neural networks you want to do for robotics and make sure that there are lots of implementations of lots of algorithms and so on so the goal is to reduce entry barrier to robotics so that more and more people can do embodied vision and embodied ai which will help us to do this we are also trying to build some benchmarks in pi robots so that if you want to test your vision algorithms on robots you will be able to do that essentially currently it has implementation for locobot which is our cheap robot you can buy it online for $5000 uh, there are three third party vendors which are selling it but it also has other robots like soyer ur5 and so on it it is integrated with a few simulators for example the facebook simulator for habitat and so on and a lot of universities like there are 25 or 30 universities that are already using pi robot so this is something which will hopefully emerge like a lot of people will share code and so on on this uh, platform all right um with that i think my talk is done hi biraf so thanks a lot for this exciting talk um so we are about to start the discussion uh, discussion section now and uh, as we are a bit ahead of schedule so we are still uh, waiting for hey everyone uh, hi ivan for some people so i see yasser victor and uh, and uh, artyom should be with us and abinav should be with us also now it's great okay guys so thanks all of you for exciting talks talks uh no, it was really exciting uh, i think also the recorded talks make it uh, easier because you can well i guess for the audience we will be able to go back and uh, see it uh, actually i did really enjoy watching them um so yeah so maybe uh, to kick off discussion so, so we have a, a today interdisciplinary talk so, so it seems we have three talks on uh, connecting graphics and vision and one talk connecting vision and uh, ro robotics and uh, maybe we can talk about this interdisciplinary disciplinarity but also uh, i think there are also questions how graphics can learn can help robotics and, uh, and so on so uh, we can look at these questions uh, during discussion but i wanted to first maybe jump directly to uh, graphic kind of questions and uh, so to ask first uh, yasser and uh, victor so, so you've shown like great amazing results uh really impressive like especially if one would see it a few years ago that would be really unbelievable uh so uh, like where in terms of technology how do you think this will continue uh, in particular it seems that there are two uh schools which are you know, more one one is more geometry based where you I guess yes sir in your case you are still using rendering events right and uh, in the work which uh, Victor has shown uh, so the approach is to generate pixels directly maybe with some geometry information which is embedded during training but at the end you the network generate pixels directly so uh, um, so first maybe general question is it really a fight between two uh, and uh, if yes where where do you think what, what is the future i'm not sure shall we go alphabetically or victor would you like to go first victor i think you your mic is off yeah uh i i, I must thank you yes sir uh, so yeah I, I don't see any contradiction 
basically when you look at both types of systems, you see uh, same components. Uh, there is a, there is geometry, some geometric, geometric representation uh, in some cases, like for, for example, body mesh in uh, the second example that I had. There are textures in both of the systems that I presented and uh, uh, there is like neural rendering, which I think is uh, everything that we do, but yes, there's uh, uh, avatars uh, also, codec avatars also have uh, neural rendering component, this is like the big part of it. So uh, there is, uh, that doesn't seem to be, you know, disparate in terms of the arsenal of tools that is used to achieve the result. Uh, there are many differences in approaches, but uh, there is no, there is no sharp divide. Uh, and uh, in both cases, uh, there is a, some, there are some graphics components and there are some neural networks. Yeah, I, I generally agree with what Victor said. I think I also see it more as a continuum. Um, and, you know, if we ask ourselves how our image is produced, there are generally two aspects to it. There's the geometry and then there's the photometry, right? Like one is where are things? The other is how do those how do those things look like? What are the pixel intensities and texture? Um, and really, that we have we can have this dial where we try to be as explicitly three D and generative as possible in terms of the geometry, the mesh, how the how the rays move in space. That's one extreme. How you know the BRDF of individual points on the space, the material properties. We can try to model those as explicitly as possible. And then there's the other extreme, which is kind of everything in image space. So it's just generators of image pixels directly from the network. And I think really like one of the interesting questions is where in the middle does the sweet spot lie uh, for things like fidelity of the image, but also interesting, I think another important factor is capacity and compute. In other words, like the more that networks have to model, uh, the more of course time they're going to take. But on the other hand, even for traditional methods like ray tracing uh, and rendering, those are also computationally expensive. My sort of uh, speculation is that there are some parts of the traditional pipeline that are so-called correct, like uh, geometry. Anything related to geometry tends to be correct. There is actually a physical instantiation of a 3D shape. Uh, that seems to be like a truth. It's actually correct. Those sorts of things are more likely to persist than things like BRDFs, a reflectance, other sorts of reflectance models, which tend to be function approxim approximators anyway. And that's where you know our best function approximators, which are neural networks, are going to apply uh, ultimately. So that's my that's my feeling. Like we will cer almost certainly sit somewhere in the middle because there's lots of phenomenon we don't know how to uh, estimate. So we'll need some sort of image space uh, corrections in any case. But the real question is where on that dial do we do we sit to get the best image quality as well as make it efficient to render? This becomes much much more important when you see things in 3D with uh, VR displays or AR displays. Those sorts of disparities, you know, they become a lot more uh, apparent. And particularly what we've seen is that we can get similar sorts of fidelities with image space methods, but they expend a lot of capacity in trying to explain uh, like view changes, those sorts of things, uh, which are very compactly represented in uh, geometry. But then on the other hand, the kind of visual fidelity that you can get uh, from images, kind of the work that Victor has shown, it's incredibly impressive, right? And that sort of thing is hard to get um, without without those image space corrections as well. So I do really feel like this is an open question. It will almost certainly lie in the middle and there's some balance between fidelity and um, compute that we'll be trading against. Okay, thanks, yes, sir. That's an uh, interesting insight. Uh, actually, there's a related question from audience. So how far are we from, uh, uh, actually, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, to your system, how far is it? To model uh, these models are from real real time formats. Are they, do they actually yeah. run in uh, VR? Yeah, yeah. So there are two aspects of this. One is the avatar creation portion, like how can you create an avatar. The second is actually the real the running of these avatars or driving from them. So the running is already currently for the faces at ninety frames per second. It's all in real time. Like we have experiences that you can do in real time. However, the the act of making these avatars. That's kind of whatever the opposite of real time is, that's what this is, because it is extremely time consuming and extremely slow. And I think one of the very important points that Victor made in his, in his uh, talk this time is our models are personalized. Like for each one, we have to ca capture a lot of data and it takes a long lot of time to compute it. 
So how we can reduce that amount in avatar generation is, is really important. So just to give you guys an idea, currently it takes about a week or two weeks of processing on a fairly large um, GPU cluster to produce one avatar. Uh, and that's after like maybe an hour or two hours of capture of that person in one of our, our big capture domes. But the experience once the, once the avatar is made, that we already have uh, real-time systems that you can, you can experience interactions in, in VR in real-time. And for capturing, actually, do you need people to have some interaction, facial expressions, like yeah, that's, that's super interesting question, right? Because this is so unexplored. We really don't, we, in the beginning, we really didn't know what to ask people. And so we asked them to make some uh, expressions to try to get the full range of motion of the face and say a few sort of uh, sentences. And I think what we saw in our work, what um, the other speakers said, Abhinav has said as well in his talk, like we follow very closely what the data produces. So we found that until we didn't capture people having sort of regular conversations, emotional conversations, we just had them sort of reading sentences. And so the avatars dis displayed this, they could not emote while speaking. And so we adapted our script to add sort of like a vignette, which included free form conversations. And then the avatars became much more expressive. And it's a continuous kind of like uh, process which we're trying to iterate on how to get that sort of like real range, the tales of human uh, behavior that are, that are so important when conveying information. And I'll add that when we go to bodies, it is even more sort of uh, varied and complex, especially when you add things like clothing, those sorts of variations, it gets, it's really interesting to ask what is that script where you have an hour or two of a person's time, what do you ask them to do to capture the range of their behavior that should represent their avatars sort of indefinitely? It's a pretty interesting optimization challenge. Great, anybody else? Comments? Uh, yes, I noticed one thing you mentioned uh, that uh, as we are getting higher and higher fidelity, it uh, becomes almost, when, and then if you, you are in VR, if you get closer to the person, it almost becomes uncomfortable. I thought, I thought this is very interesting. So it's, it sounds like as better we get, as better technology we get, so maybe we will need a social distance in VR, like a social distance. <laughs> <laughs> so it, we, we, it's certainly a kind of like the etiquettes that we have in real life. Uh, we want to we want to preserve it, right? And and I mean there are all sorts of kind of concerns and dangers that are going to emerge in VR that may not have emerged in real life because of you know sort of um, uh, social norms and those sorts of things. And I think one of the very important there are going to be many important sort of ethical, almost philosophical questions on what's actually right, what's actually what should the etiquette be in these sorts of spaces that we haven't explored yet. Uh, they're really interesting questions. And what you had said, right, you know, if you get too close to an avatar, honestly, it feels like you're invading their private space. I mean, it, it, it feels exactly like that. And uh, someone who tried the system recently, he, he met the person for the very first time in VR, hadn't seen them before. And then they, they sort of walked out and talked to them in another room and they said, I feel like I know you. I feel like I've met you before. And that he said that's a, a sensation that they've never had with video conferencing. You know, even after you talk to someone over VC, when you meet them, you sort of feel the need to introduce yourself or say I'm meeting you for the first time. He said it, that that was a difference for, for him when he actually talked to the person for the first time in VR. It's very interesting. Maybe if coming back a bit uh, to technologies, I'm also wondering, uh, so in image generation, so it's, uh, I think it's obvious, well, there is a, um, some study we did also in our lab so that if you just uh, watch videos, then most of the pixels, they belong to people. So it's uh, no surprise that image generation, of course, it addresses different kind of images, but people are the first thing to try to model. So that's uh, pretty clear. Um, yet, of course, we are not uh, like, okay, faces, uh, heads, uh, bodies, this is great. So next, uh, what's next? So probably we want to not just model people, but also scenes, um, maybe dynamic scenes. And so related to this and maybe related to what we uh, talked before. So, um, so here, if you think of modeling scenes, like having a 3D models for scenes will become quite complicated, right? Because for people, you can have kind of generic models, which we have fine tuned a bit, but for, for objects having, assuming we have 3D geometry uh, is uh, maybe strong assumption. Maybe this is also something to open up worked uh, on uh, estimating 3D geometry quite quite a bit for scenes. So like yeah. So generating scenes as uh, in addition to people and uh, how do we 
how can we model this? There are a few good groups that are working on this. Uh, Matthias Niesner's group. Um, there's uh, we have a team in in FRL as well, the Surreal team, um, and there are a couple of other uh, groups. There's I saw some recent work by Michael Black and his team. I think folks are beginning to explore this a little bit. And as you say, you know, it's much harder to have a, a repository or space of of chairs, for instance. It's a much more deep and difficult problem. But you know, I think some of it is that we can create it on the fly, like through the movement of the head using SLAM. Those sorts of methods can give us uh, some degree of uh, scene information. Depth cameras, are those necessary? Those might be able to give us some. We do actually have some interesting results on, um, on scene generation, but I did want to, before like uh, passing this over, point a very interesting problem, which is that the scene itself needs to be interpreted and have a, have a sort of computational representation because the scene uh, influences the people in the, in the scene as well. Like for instance, Ivan, your uh, view, if, if we look at you, you have this sort of like shine or sheen at the top of your head uh, because of the light at the top, right? That's because you're sitting in an environment you are in uh, and then the way you sound depends on how your scene, your room is arranged around you. And it's important that we, we hear it that way. So we need to have a computational representation, not just a reconstruction, but an interpretable uh, you know, representation of the scene that in fact influences the person, how they look and how they sound as well. So these are not disconnected problems. I think they're very intrinsically related to one another. So um, I would like to add something here because I think this is partly one of the reasons why I actually started moving into robotics. So I think it's a very nice uh, segue. I mean, so I think that's what is very, very hard. Like if you look at computer vision, right? I mean, object detection, the standard problems, we have made huge advances like chair detection or couch detection, bed detection will work really good. But when it comes to manipulable objects, like objects which are small, the performance is still pretty bad uh, in computer vision. And I think that's where it's a philosophical question, right? Is just downloading like lots of images from internet good enough for understanding manipulable objects or modeling of manipulable objects? Like Yasser said, okay, maybe we can have slam kind of approaches. Sure, if you have a bottle, if you do slam kind of approaches, maybe you can deconstruct that bottle. But the whole idea that when you open the bottle, what will the, be the view inside it is very, very hard to model. And I think that's where um, I personally started moving into robotics because I think it can be argued this whole theory of mind kind of uh, aspect, right? That you can only understand these objects when you have started interacting with them yourself. And I don't know if it is true or not, but that's kind of an argument with someone, which a lot of psychologists have made that to understand bottles, you have to play with bottles essentially, right? You have to see how things open, that when you open them, the uh, depth changes and so on. And that kind of interactions, uh, rich interactions are very hard to get in um, without actually having robots or agents trying to do them themselves. And so I think my, my feeling is the biggest problem, and I'm going to put it as a challenge, the biggest challenge that lies in front of computer vision is manipulable objects, I mean, in semantics I'm talking about, I'm, I'm sure 3D and other stuff, there are much more other problem, interesting problems and so on. But manipulable objects is like something I feel, which is a very hard problem. It's problem from object action detection, action recognition as well, perspective as well. Like you can probably un do very easily on handshakes or walking and running and those kind of action like Ivan would uh, certify like, I mean, like Eva data set, you can do really good at talking and dialogues and so on. But when it comes to human object interaction, uh, categories, we are horribly bad again. So I think the biggest challenge in front of AI is manipulable objects. And interestingly, my my bet is, and that's why I've got chosen that path, is that it will go via robotics because we will need to understand. I mean, it's kind of the theory of mind that you will need to interact with the objects. You need to play with these objects to understand the underlying 3D, the underlying dynamics, the underlying uh, physics behind these objects, essentially. And so I think, yeah, that, that I wanted to add that aspect as well to this. Yeah, I think this is great. This, is, this brings us to the uh, connection between image generation and robotics and simulation. Because, um, uh, yeah, so the question I have is, uh, so image generation, is it just for fun and for looking good? Or is it also for, uh, for example, training robots? So problem we know is that, uh, yeah, for like, collecting, as Abhinav said, collecting the uh, real data for robotics is a really challenge. And our current methods now, they just too data hungry. And uh, it's like, if you train as in simulator, then, then you need millions of uh, steps and trials and that's just not affordable in, re in real life. So, uh, so one thing is sim physical simulators, but also another thing is uh, 
is a yeah how, how images look like. So uh, so is there a connection? So maybe I've been up to you first. So do you think there is a space to? Uh, well, yeah, we, we believe there is a space for image generation to to fill this gap between uh, reality and uh, uh, what we want um, to learn. Yeah. So I mean, I think um, this is. I'm going to. This is where I think I might disagree with some, but I mean, I actually think that there is a big role of image generation to play for robotics, uh, especially like forward dynamics. Like one of the things that you need in robotics to be sample efficient is forward dynamics model that if you do, if you're in current, whatever you are, if you do an action, how the world is going to be so that you can plan out in the future and basically uh, use that uh, like hallucinated plans to figure out what exactly is the thing uh, you should do uh, personally. However, I mean, this is something which has changed with me in last three years. Like three years ago, if you asked me this question, I would give a very diff different answer. I would I was all in gung-ho about interaction, interaction, interaction. And I think in the last three years, what I have learned is interaction is critical, but it's actually the, the best part is where the passive data meets the active data. I think that's where a lot of fun happens essentially. So like, for example, babies, I mean, I was spending a lot of time uh, uh, watching the passive data, like watching what their parents do things and so on. And that has what guided their exploration in the world, essentially. And so how does this passive data relates to active data? By active, I mean, like you also started interacting well. And that's where I think image generation could play a role. Like, I mean, you can learn how to generate forward models and generate images. Uh, I mean, by the way, when I say image generation, I'm taking a very generic view. Generating pixels versus generating something in the future is different. To me, I think generating something is critical, not pixels, but I mean, I'm sure from graphics perspective, you would say, okay, I want to, if I can, if I'm predicting something, why not just predict the whole pixels and so on? It can be argued either way. I mean, I'm not going to go into that debate of generating pixel, but I am just talking about generating future uh, states as well. So that could be a big role between uh, graphics and uh, and this kind of gen image generation. Uh, like you can basically generate, you can learn how to predict gen uh, dynamics from passive data, and then you are kind of verifying them by physically interacting in the world that, oh, this is what I learned that if you uh, open the bottle, this is how it, my parents showed that it looks like to me. And now I will go and myself do and see if I can get similar uh, uh, actions, like if similar actions will generate similar kind of uh, results and so on. So yeah, I think it plays a good role. What, where I might dis dis uh, not agree with, like my, where there might be disagreement is, I think this should be totally data-driven process. And now I, I'm going to be, it should not be guided by any hand design of Newton physics and so on. Everything should be data driven here. And um, this is what is kind of very, very critical. But I think this uh, this is something which is debatable for sure. Thanks. Anybody else on this? Well, I have one comment on this. I think one of the, the biggest challenges, simulation without question, you know, offers a lot of promise in terms of like speed and then variability and for experimentation, there's nothing faster than simulation. So there are lots of upsides. I think the big question on its utility is about the long tail of most distributions of the data that we're trying to capture. So where simulations can can produce, can help produce that long tail, like, um, I mean, uh, I mean, I've just expressed sort of uh, questions about um, physics simulators. So maybe that, that isn't a direction, but if, for instance, uh, simulators can actually generate lots of instances that would just be time consuming or difficult and produce a lot of variants. I think they're really useful. For, they would be useful from that regard. A place where we tried to use them where I found that they were not as useful because it's not easy to get to the long tail uh, of the distributions is clothing simulation, for instance. Like we have to, if we, it makes sense that, you know, we want to simulate how clothing moves. We just uh, do it through simulation. Problem is that for every, you know, outfit, it takes a lot of time and effort and it's very hard to actually gen generate a lot of different clothing configurations and their dynamics well, even through simulation. So then you end up being with like a few dozen outfits and it doesn't, it doesn't really pro provide that kind of scale. So I think my test or just kind of like rule of thumb would be if simulation offers you a quick way to get to the tails of distributions, it's likely to be useful. If it doesn't, then it's unlikely to be, it's unlikely to be that useful in the long run. So maybe question to our term. So is there a magic direction in gun space which will uh, generate uh, all kinds of clothes for you, sir? Uh, probably not yet, <laughs> but maybe it'll be. Yeah, we'd be very interested if you can produce that, uh, Artem. I see. <laughs> <laughs>
I see. <laughs> okay. We are, we are working on this, actually. Okay, so you are working on clothing. Okay. Well, no, not on clothing exactly, but on different parts of uh, different objects, let's say. Okay. okay. So I have a question from audience to you. So here's a, someone asking, um, your model learned a bunch of directions. What percentage of uh, these directions, uh, sorry, directions, what percentage of these directions uh, are actually useful or interpretable visually? So did you have well, to uh, hunt I see, I see, I see, I see. Uh, well, it depends on the model. Uh, for some models, it's about uh, maybe 30%. Uh, for some models, it's about 70%, something like that. Mm -hmm. So typical values are yeah, between 30 and 70. Okay. And, uh, I, and had you? A, I had a question. I know that was, I'm not sure whether we can cross-examine uh, our, our co-panelists, but may I, may I ask uh, Artem a quick question? Sure, yeah, please go ahead. So one thought I had was that, you know, a lot of interpretability, like how we perceive things, cognitive neuroscientists scientists know is unconscious. Like we're not aware of what we're kind of interpreting or extracting from images or video or behavior. Um, so how do you think about interpretability when a lot of it is likely unconscious? Oh, uh, never thought of this actually. Uh, so. Well, uh, what was actually the question that you asked uh, the online uh, evaluators? Uh, well, just if, uh, if this what was the evaluation procedure? I mean, yes. Okay, so basically, we asked uh, people with computer science and machine learning background, so probably they are biased, but uh, uh, they were asked if uh, a particular direction uh, affects. Uh, uh, the only uh, factor of variation, and uh, it uh, operates consistently for different uh, latent codes in the latent spaces. Mm -hmm. So basically, it was like that. So I, I'm not sure if it adds, if it answers your question. Uh, sorry. Maybe I had a question at when while listening to your talk. Um, and maybe I've missed some details, but uh, so so currently, so you, your work is to find out, like take guns and uh, find out what is uh, what does it do. So I was wondering, once you have these directions, which uh, might be interesting, do you think, or is it interesting to to use this knowledge as a constraint to learn gun? Um, maybe related to question that guns are hard to learn, uh, like if. It seems that the more the more prior knowledge you put in them, the uh, and of course useful prior knowledge, then uh, the training could become useful. I'm thinking like if you discover the useful uh, directions in guns, could you put them as a constraint, like when you train next gun, that they would be uh, li limiting the space of image variation? Well, from, from our experience, actually, uh, we uh, need a, a good generative model to have good directions. <laughs> so probably uh, the opposite is true, but no. Uh, uh, good directions are only found in already good generative models. So, yeah, probably not. Okay, so you, you cannot reuse them for, for future well, as well. Uh, well, uh, pro, uh, I cannot tell you from the top of my head about this. So I, I have to think about it. Yeah, one provocative question. So, so every time we tried in using guns for for something for tra for training synans, right? So to generate data for training synans, mm -hmm. somehow somehow never never helped. Uh, and it seems like many so people are. Uh, giving less hope on this now. So uh, do you, oh, do you know why? <laughs> okay. So uh, are you saying that uh, common knowledge now is that uh, synthetic data from GANs is not useful? That's kind of impression I have. Maybe my, my oh, I, 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 I'm sort of disagree here. <laughs> okay, that's good. So, that's uh, good news. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, we'll see something uh, exciting about, about it in the nearest future. Okay. Uh, from 
so from the published work I know of uh, some works on ray identification do report uh, uh, several percent increase on gen generated data, right? Uh, and in, the, in those cases, GANs serve as some kind of smart data augmentation. And as a good data augmentation, it helps, uh, doesn't give dramatic improvement, but it gives some improvement. Uh, I've heard of some unpublished works, so for example, different recognition tasks where the results were even better. Okay. Right. So I have a set of uh, non-technical questions which are in the area of dangerous AI, which I think, uh, well, if I don't take them up, then it would somehow come up anyway. And then that's actually both for graphics and for, for robotics. What should I start first? Okay, let's let's take up enough robotics. So, question. So, uh, curious robot. So this is great. So, but can curious robot become uh, harmful? I imagine the question is, if you make a robot curious, then at some point it will be curious what happens if I if it stacks the knife in somebody's <laughs> back. The uh, the right answer to this is it. I mean. We are so far away. I mean, so first, we are so far away in robotics that I think if you say, I, can you pick up a knife uh, confidently? I mean, I'm not even sure uh, robots can do that. I mean, so I think in terms of ro ro uh, robotics, I mean, we are very, very far away. I, there's no generalization whatsoever. And even if you, I mean, the only robotics that I know work reasonably well is uh, in structured environments, essentially. So I don't think... Uh, we are anywhere close but up on top of that i think these curiosity stuff models and so on i mean again we are again in those ones as well i mean uh, we have just crashed the surface you have no idea how to model curiosity curiosity is a very generic term i mean of course i understand that. and we have some model for it and so on but and current models are very constrained in the sense that uh you cannot just do random stuff or something like the action spaces are very restrained and so on so my feeling is I do not see any such fear, at least. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's also good to know. Okay, before leaving, yeah, going, not going away from robotics topic, I have a question which puzzles me as we also do some robotics uh, here. And uh, uh, the question is about long term. So, mo most of the things we are trying to do now with uh, le like le learn based robotics are like short term actions. And uh, as you go to, if you want to go long term, obviously. And there, uh, if we if we are going to do robotics, like, like if we are going to do experiments in real life, some some uh, learning in real life, we would need to have a reset button. And uh, reset button means that how how do we learn? Like for now, if you just put objects into into a train and ask robots to pick it up, so there's a just not, like cleverly designed way that uh, it can restart automatically. So if you want to learn how to make coffee or make dishes and uh, lots of other things, so it seems complicated I, unless there is a, somebody just standing beside, like how do they do long-term large-scale experiments? Do you have any, any thoughts on this? Right. I mean, I, I think there are two things here. I mean, um, so first I'm, I think whatever is so the question of long term, like how would you go for long term? I mean, again, I think my answer is that, um, like we have seen in many AI areas, right? Whatever is easy for humans is not necessarily easy for uh, agents, and whatever is necessarily easy for agents is not necessarily easy for humans. The chess and manipulation example, like vision example, right? I mean, vision is pretty easy for humans, but chess is very hard, and the other way around is true for our agents, essentially the games and so on. I think it's kind of somewhere there i feel personally i feel like um because short term actions and short term i mean like opening a bottle and not pouring or like 10 different actions together that i think because it requires modeling the richness of the world is very very hard for us but planning in the longer term probably might turn out much easier for uh, us because we can have large memories and so on in 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 agents and so on that's the first thing which i wanted to say the second thing i think the reset kind of a thing, which if I understood well, I mean, you're saying that the resets are hard. And so 
it's hard to learn in the real world i think frankly we want to go into this direction of where i mean even vision is not there uh, if we think vision is working these new we were like we want to be in the place where we can actually learn with one or two examples or three examples and so on um, by using lots and lots of data of from the past and so hopefully i mean that so initial data is going to be very curiosity driven data like you are basically exploring the world you are learning representations for actions and world and so on but once as you are learning when you are trying to do the task itself probably you will not need more than a few examples uh, to solve the task that's what the my hope is and essentially like and that's what seems like a lot of uh, humans uh, like as babies like we are exploring the world a lot like we are doing a lot of interactions as exploration but for tasks probably we don't need that many especially once we have trained our representations properly it doesn't take that many uh, actions yes 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 that's uh... hopefully we will be there sometimes before before our career ends <laughs> <laughs> that i think the story there is i actually never thought object detection will be where where before our career ends and now i mean like i remember 2005 when i was doing my first paper on object detection 10% i was so happy and now i think and i if someone asked me like where we are will we be here today i was like no no i don't think so but yeah things I mean, it's a, it's about one or two breakthroughs which will just get us there. I hope it happens here. Yeah. So, right to this, I just seen the uh, talk by Peter Abil on on uh, Ikra today. He was talking about his uh, uh, his new thing. So, it's called the uh, or the the contrastive loss. So the contrastive loss, which was working now good for images, so it's apparently also. Works well in robotics. Do you, do you have, do you have any? Uh, like this seems to be quite recent work. Do you, do you know anything of this? The first part. Sorry. Who talked about it? The contrastive. Oh, the the uh, Peter Abil. Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, contrastive work is actually very exciting. I mean, especially in cell vision and so on. But yeah, I mean, I don't know what is happening in. I mean, robotics. There, are, there are at least two or three papers I know which have tried and it. seems to have not been that big but i mean who knows i mean it's also about sometimes like just doing the right application of these things into uh it will take a few tries before it works like even the contrastive in vision uh, the first paper came out one and a half years ago but now things are starting to look much better so yeah right to be seen okay so uh, coming back to dangerous ai uh, so we we have to take up the fakes so what do you guys have to say about this uh, should it should it be all afraid when that people are afraid uh, so i i just think that the the questions are genuine and the concerns are genuine and actually i think they they do sort of scratch the surface of possible issues not they're not non addressable but i think they're serious issues personally speaking when i think about it you know um deep fakes and that sort of stuff it is a uh, it's what i call an existential threat to telepresence and the reason is because you know trust is the medium of communication when you call your mother and she hears your voice she ha- doesn't have an iota of doubt that what she's hearing is what you said exactly even though the microphone sort of picks up some sort of frequency band even though it's digitized it's packetized sent over the network and reconstructed then an imperfect speaker produces it she doesn't have kind of she doesn't even think about it she believes exactly what you said is what she heard and what you guys are seeing is what i'm actually gesticulating and saying and moving like and this is inherently why people use it because they trust the medium so if this kind of doubt comes into people's mind that uh is it really ivan who's talking over here is it really my spouse who's talking over here i think it it kills the trust and it's an exist- existential threat to telepresence as a service so we're very much motivated to see how we can solve this issue of um of identity and how we can preserve that trust right from the start um i do also feel like you know in a sense uh deep fakes have existed for like um for like decades right people are people have been doctoring photos for a long time photoshop has existed for a long time so probably in the long run what will happen is culture will will evolve we'll get kind of like um an immunity to these just culturally people will be skeptical about what they see in a way that they're they're not right now uh my feeling is though this is a this is a real kind of there will be a a painful bump which we're already seeing uh but past that i think culture will culture will will evolve along with tools of authentication 
to, to address this sort of issue. Yeah, that's a great yeah. point. Go on. Yeah, I think uh, that the systems that, uh, you know, that, um, uh, the, for example, sensors uh, that have sensors that capture uh, the mimics or telepresence, for example, they almost by definition uh, have good ways uh, to validate and to authenticate uh, the user, right? So, for example, if, if, uh, if uh, the phone is my sensor and uh, so I use it, for example, for video conferencing, then uh, uh, the phone has the camera and uh, other sensors at the spot and the protocol can be devised that validates that it's indeed me speaking, uh, you know, the one on like the anti-spoofing problem. So these methods are uh, being developed and the richer are the set of sensors that we use during telepresence, the better we can uh, validate, for example, that uh, the avatar being used by the same person, uh, by the owner of the avatar. Unless, of course, the whole program is being broken, but then we're sort of just moving into the computer security um, domain. So as long as the program, program is valid, uh, the fact that we're using sensors makes it possible to validate that the avatar and the owner uh, are the same that they match each other, each other. So I think this is uh, one of the reasons uh, why I think deep fake uh, scares are a bit overblown. Uh, so that's uh, in the telepresence, which is, uh, I didn't think of it actually, uh, but uh, also in the, if you go from telepresence just for, any video which we see, uh, so of a person, right? So like that five years ago, you would not doubt. Now we can doubt easily that uh, wasn't really. Uh, well, five years ago, Photoshop was already there. Yes, but videos, right? So, so my my take on it is Hollywood. Hollywood was but, also yeah. was also there. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think it. I, th I think the big difference is the barrier to entry is much lower now, right? Like before, as you say, Victor, it was um, Hollywood studios that did exist, you know, movies were made, but you had you had to have multi-billion dollar budgets and a full studio to make it. I think where we're headed is uh, anybody would be able to produce these. And I think that's what, uh, you know, I think causes people concern. There's much less like regulatory um, uh, like mechanisms to to reduce it. But I feel like you know uh, it will arise, and then culture will will sort of have to adapt. Um, that's likely what will happen. And and as we've seen in the kind of like security industry, uh, it's very interesting, right? Because they have these sort of adversarial sub communities. There's one group that's trying to build stronger and stronger encryption methods, and another group that's trying you know better and better ways to break them. So just like that, I expect in our community we'll start to see these sort of adversarial sub communities where people are trying to build more and more realistic things and uh, people will develop more and more sophisticated ways of de detecting whether these are fake or not. Uh, and we've already actually seen some of this work. I'm sure we're, we're, all, of, we're all familiar with it at CVPR and other conferences. Okay, so basically the conclusion that humanity will adapt. So there's no way to, there's no reason to, uh, to be over scared. Fine, so, is anybody else wants to add anything? I think I'm out of questions. And we are actually out of time as well, so. Thank you for arranging this, Ivan. It was a very interesting set of talks and uh, the discussion was really interesting as well. Great, thanks. Thanks everybody for joining today. And uh, yeah, actually I can mention that uh, we were over this three days, I think we are over 4,000 uh, uh, people who are watching us which is, uh, seems to be a good success. And uh, it was really a pleasure to have you all and uh, also to have all the audience and questions during these three days. And um, I hope we will uh, see each other again soon and not only in telepresence, but in, in real. <laughs> yeah. okay. okay, 
So thank you all and uh, have a good day. Bye.